Hello, good evening, a big warm welcome to the European Amateur Championships from Minsk. My name's Steve Holdsworth. With me, I'm very pleased to say, Adrian Dodson, a former double Olympian and, of course, remembered for that heroic stance against Winky Wright and his light middleweight title shot. Welcome, Adrian. Thanks very much for having me. Our first bout this evening is a flyweight contest between the Frenchman, Enom Bernard, and he's boxing a man called Peter Balash from Slovakia. I hope these two boxes are as difficult as the names are to pronounce. <laughs> yes, we'll find an awful lot of that here, I'm afraid. There's the Frenchman. That's Enom Bernard. And Dominic Nata, who's trainer, big man. So the Frenchman in the blue corner. Here is Peter Balash from Slovakia. 23 years of age, by the way, Balash. And he also boxed in the 1996 Olympic Games. Here's the Frenchman being announced. Runner up in the World Championships in 1995. And now, everything's changed in the world of amateur boxing. It's no longer three three-minute rounds. It's now five twos. And of course, we have the same contentious judging system. Five judges sat at ringside, any three of which must, within one second of each other, press either the blue or red button to register a point. They often get it wrong. Initial thoughts. And the boxing now is extremely different from what it was, say, five, ten years ago. It's a lot more emphasis on effectiveness now, rather than skill and finesse, as the way it was before. The judges, of course, far more likely these days to score for the man who throws the one single eye-catching long punch as opposed to the boxer who likes to get close and blaze away with a, a flurry of shots. Of course, you can land six or seven punches in the one second period, and of course, the judges can't pick that up. Yes, what is also very ridiculous is the fact that uh, a boxer can throw a tremendous amount of punches during a particular round, and when that round is concluded, he has no score whatsoever, which is very outrageous. Absolutely, we've seen plenty of that over the years. And of course, don't forget that this scoring system was brought in as a result of the obvious corruption that took place in the, uh, the Seoul Games. Of course, you, uh, you boxed in those games yourself for Guyana. Yes, I did. Under a different name? Uh, the name was Karub then. Also, they, you know, it really takes away from the, uh, the effectiveness of body punching as well. The boxers seem to predominantly headhunt each other now, trying to have the jarring of the head so they can get the judge's attention. Absolutely right. And uh, another contentious issue, of course, we just get these out of the way in this first round, is the use of headguards. But uh, anyway, that's a, a very moot point. I don't believe they add to the safety of the boxer. But back to the action here, as we can see this uh, diminutive Frenchman in the blue vest, Inom Bernard, 22 years of age runner-up as I said in the world championships in 1995 and as you can see there the Slovakian is one point in front I find it totally unbelievable I mean yes the judges you know, all they've done is record one single blow landing in that first round and I, I must I, I must uh, explain to you the way the scoring system works um, the computer filters the scores it removes the highest and lowest and makes it a mean of the remaining three, uh, which of course still makes it quite bizarre that the mean should come up with one against zero. There you are. Once more, a touch of replay from round one. <coughs> Both boxes in the first round seem very tentative of each other. I guess they're trying to figure out each other's style. It must be nerves, Adrian. Uh, in those major competitions, it's always nerves. To well, a certain well you know all about that, of course, having boxed in uh, Seoul and, of course, in Barcelona. And, of course, we'll get a chance to hear Adrian's views about Olympic boxing, or Olympic-level boxing, anyway, hopefully over this next week. And, of course, his uh, efforts in the professional ranks. But back to this action here. And uh, you saw at the end of round one, Peter Balash of Slovakia in the red vest went back to his stall with a one-point advantage at 1-0. Another thing is, the coaches are always aware of the score because of the monitors around the hall. 
in a way, that is a, is a disadvantage of that, really, in a sense, because it puts an added anxiety on the boxer, because him feeling that he might be in a sense of control and then realizing he's actually behind, causes him to actually uh, become reckless in a certain way. Absolutely. Yes, and of course, the other, the other thing is the demoralization aspect. You may think you're winning quite comfortably and go back to your corner and find you're actually behind and haven't landed a single blow that uh, the judges can pick up in a, in, in a round, and it can completely destroy you. Also, the fact that uh, some of the discrepancy of the scoring system itself is the fact that if a, a particular judge has a bias, he doesn't necessarily have to press that button. So you can probably be throwing as much clean, visible shots as you can, but that does not necessarily mean that if he's not one of the three judges not scoring at that exact point, it's not going to land. Sure. <coughs> so not too much left then in this uh, second. Not too much left then in this second round of the scheduled five twos. So far, the, um, the Slovakian fighters seem to be the more aggressive, more willing to take chances to land, to score his shots. Well, he just caught, got caught there with a very effective like right hand. Hopefully, that would have scored. Well, this little Frenchman, let's see what he's got. Well, it, the, the Frenchman in the blue vest is two, three behind after two rounds, and it's not really beyond him here. In fact, it's anyone's fight, really. And uh, Peter Balash there, not using the stool to rest. I mean, it's a real sprint, isn't it, five twos? How do you feel about that, Adrian? Do you, do you think it was more of a man's distance, three threes, as opposed to five twos? It had it had an element of, um, you know, you, you had a certain uh, limitation where you know you can exert yourself to a certain degree. Whereas five twos, especially with the scoring system, adding that extra added pressure to that, it, it, it kind of takes away from the uh, tradition and essence of the game, in my opinion. So a retrograde step then for amateur boxing. And really, this, this, I think this European Championships here in Belarus have got a chance of uh, putting amateur boxing back on the map. It's had, uh, well, it's had 10 years, really, of uh, being in the doldrums. A chance to be reborn here as we go out for round three of the scheduled five in the flyweight division. These lads weigh a maximum of 51 kilograms. Just remind you once again, Inon Bernard, the Frenchman in the white shorts, blue vest, 22 years of age. And he's won 65 of his 75 contests. Runner-up in the 1995 World Championships. And he's against a man called Peter Balash from Slovakia. He's 23. And he's won 60 of his 90. And he also boxed in the Olympic Games in 1996 and the World Championships. And of course it's not beat the man, it's beat the machine, isn't it? Exactly. So you're actually fighting against two opponents. The man in front of you and the machine that you are, you're hoping is in your favor. I guess in a way also the, the, the longer rounds give the boxer the disadvantage and opportunity to try to get himself back into the contest. If he's aware that he's actually behind it is. Oh, that's a good shot by the Frenchman. Lovely right hand and again, that's three of them that time. Oh, and it takes a good shot there back from Balash. So a lively round here in round three, and I don't think Balash is completely right. Got a bit of a punch up on our hands now. He got stunned there a little bit with that right hand from Bernard. Bernard seems to be taking initiative this round, going forward. Maybe he's been aware that uh, he's been notified by his corner that he's actually behind. Yes, that's uh, quite a possibility. And it's worth reminding our viewers, of course, Adrian, that uh, you fought uh, Francis Vastag. Uh, you lost to Vastag, in fact, in your uh, Barcelona Olympics. Four all now after three rounds, two to go. And it's leveled up, and I think that's about right level yes, now, don't yes, you? I, I mean, the, the irony is, although we might not agree with the scoring, there seems to be very few bad decisions at this level. Sometimes, sometimes. I mean, majority of the times, you know, as you, we saw in the first round, where you thought there was a lot more done than, than the punches landed. But uh, 
As you can see, Bernard, he's on merit, got himself back into the picture. So three rounds gone, four points all. Two to go, all to play for. And that's a lovely right hook counter punch there from uh, Balash. It's clear as the eye can see. Yes, she lost to Francis Vastag, as I say in Barcelona. I hate to remind you of that. Um, you seem to have fought the wrong kind of fight, Adrian. Does that make any sense? Um, maybe to the, those viewing the fight may look at it that way, but um, I was very much aware of what was needed to be done, and I was very much aware of the scoring session at the time, and I was very much aware going into the final round that uh, we were both even. Uh, it's just a case of uh, being uh, totally dehydrated and uh, just please God let the bell ring so I can be on my feet. Okay. So Adrian Dodson then matched at the wrong weight in most people's opinions in fact that year but there was a great deal more to it of course than just uh, what we saw on the surface and we may get a chance to explore a bit of that as the week goes by. So round four, 40 seconds on the clock in this particular session uh, still anybody's fight. That's the, of course, the 32nd European Championships. It's kind of funny. You, in the third round, Bernard uh, obviously probably was being notified that he was behind, and he was much more aggressive, whereas he came on the in the fourth round, and he's much more, uh, you know, they both seem to be trying to uh, allow each other to take the first initiative. Oh, good right hand. Oh, and well, that's, was that a knockdown, or was that a stumble? Yeah, I think he more stumbled and lost balance. Well, I've got a feeling that Balash has uh, probably tamed this uh, little Frenchman. He's uh, certainly gained his respect with the right hand of his own. He wants to watch that. Bernard seemed to be very effective at countering against Balash. Oh, that's nice punching from... Bernard. Once again, though, those punches thrown far too quickly for the judges to appreciate. They're both getting very competitive now. Obviously, they're aware of what's at stake. Going so that's round four. Round. One to go. And it's worth also reminding our viewers that the scoring system was brought in as a result of corruption in Korea, namely the Roy Jones defeat to Park C. Hun. But more interestingly, as we were just discussing earlier, Adrian, there were lots more, weren't there? There were several other uh, disputed decisions that was made during that particular game in, in Seoul. But obviously, uh, it's due to the power of nations that's involved, the clout and, and the way that they carry. You know, there were many individuals. Uh, the, the, the very same uh, opponent, Roy Jones, was scandalously ro robbed against. He boxed, uh, I think it was uh, Nardiello in the quarterfinals. And Nardiello clearly won that fight. And he literally went berserk in the ring when the decision was given to the Korean. Yes. But obviously, you know, that was not uh, as big a news because the United States was a much more powerful nation than, I guess, Italy. So here we are then, round five. This is the final chance for both these lads to uh, get enough points on the computer oh goodness me that's interesting look how much that's changed because it's ironic i thought peter balash actually won that fourth round and suddenly he's six points behind so did i actually thought he won that more an effective punching <laughs> so we're gonna get the first bad nod then of these particular championships don't forget it's always our opinion it's not to you know we don't have any official say in this we're here simply to guide you and hopefully point you in the right direction um, if you agree with us that Balash in the red shirt looked like he won round four and uh, and should have been credited with it, but uh, <laughs> we've seen so many judges hit the wrong colour button as well, haven't we? Exactly, so much for opinions. I think uh, the, the way that the scoring system is, it makes the fool out of the most respectable uh, commentator. Obviously, um, and Bernard would have been notified that he's ahead significantly and maybe plan to avoid full contact. Yes, of course, it can lull you into a false sense of security. Well, nice little punches there. Good, good exchange by these two lads. I 
again, maybe the effectiveness of, of the boxing on the scoring system is what maybe the judges are mainly keenly to look at because Bernard seemed to be landing the more effective punches, the more clean, cleanly cut ones, as he did just there. Hmm, interesting. Great right hand there by Bernard. Well, it looks like this Frenchman's winning the final round, but uh, I think there's going to be some argument about the score at the end of all this. The Frenchman has shown a lot of uh, boxing skill and ability boxing from the defense. So it's all over now. Um, let me ask you, Adrian, are we, look at that massive score now. I mean, not a single wow. punch recorded for Balash yeah. in the last three rounds. Yeah. It's ludicrous. Four all after two rounds, not a single punch for Balash. And that's uh, a very, very accurate reflection of just how this uh, scoring system has changed this sport. Yeah, obviously Bernard landed the more effective punches, and maybe it, it was a way to sway the judge's uh, way of looking at it. But uh, it still, it, it makes a mockery of the other guy's ability and his effort. Absolutely. Anyway, are we looking at the flyweight European champion, do you think? It's a possibility. Possibility. He's very technical. He has a good... So there are then. Inom Bernard wins the first belt. Well, still to come tonight, we've got the featherweights, 57 kilograms. Falk Huster from Germany in action against Leonid Schwarz from Israel. Stay with us. What's your... And this is the featherweight division, 57 kilograms. And it's between Falk Huster from Germany in the red corner. And he's boxing a man called Leonid Schwartz from Israel. Now, interesting match, this one. Huster, 26 years of age. And, of course, we all became very familiar with him in Atlanta, where he represented Germany. There he is, and he's got uh, a very ungainly style. And, uh, well, Leonid Schwartz is going to have problems here, undoubtedly, with this uh, very odd style of the German. So, round one. With me still, of course, Adrian Dodson. And uh, I don't think Israel's had uh, too many successful fighters over the years, has it? No, they, they haven't, but they've actually been involved. Uh, going back to their first uh, amateur boxer to ever compete in an in a Olympic competition, a gentleman by the name of Shlomo Niazov, who was actually the first Israeli to compete in the 1984 Olympics. And then they've had several other boxers over the years, like uh, another boxer by the name of Yakov. And uh, a boxer I competed against in the Olympic trials in uh, 92 against, uh, I can't recall his name. That's okay. And they've got three qualifiers here, incidentally. The Israeli team tend to have a, a very eclectic combination because a lot of uh, multi-nationalities uh, um, actually reside there, obviously, into the obviously Jewish faith. And uh, they also tend to appoint several Cuban uh, coaches on occasions. Very sensible move. And Huster, one of ten German qualifiers. In fact, they've actually managed to reduce the amount of competitors in this year's event. They've cut it right down now to 192, which will produce 180 contests. And uh, that's quite a considerable cut from the 304 boxers and 291 bouts that took place in uh, Viela in Denmark a couple of years ago. I guess also that's a result of also the uh, increase in rounds, the 5-2 rounds, because uh, maybe I have to cream with the crop, because I have, just imagine having that amount of competitors at 5 too many rounds. That's a lot of work. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be a judge then. Well, Falk Huster, not quite as ungainly as I remember him. Huster seems to have a perfect style for the computer. Oh, absolutely. Yes, you almost made for him, wasn't it? Yes. So there's the end of round one. Let's see what the computer thinks as they both go back to their corner. Well, there you are, Huster winning 2-1 at the end of round one. 
without having to exert himself that much. Absolutely. 26 years of age, Gustav now. World Cup winner in 1994, second in the World Championships in 97. No, second in the World Championships, my apologies, of 1994, finalist in 1997. 149 bouts, Husta, 114 victories. That's very good form. And very experienced. Absolutely. And Schwartz, of course, well, he's 29, one of the oldest competitors here. He's won 52 of his 60 and is the reigning Israeli champion. And uh, one common fact is that both these men are professional soldiers. So they are most certainly know the art of discipline. Absolutely. So round two then of the scheduled five, and uh, Leonid Schwartz not too far behind here. Only a point against Falk Huster. Very hard man to score points off, isn't he? Well, this looks that way. How would you tackle a man like Huster with those very high gloves? He looks very exposed downstairs, doesn't he? He looks very exposed downstairs, but the problem again being that uh, the, the body punches will most likely be overlooked. Yeah, I guess maybe t t to lure him into a false attempt by using feints. Most likely to draw him out of that uh, very European oblongs. You don't see style. too much fainting though and dummy in uh, amateur boxing these days. Do it seems like a forgotten art, doesn't it? No, it, it, in a way, I know it sounds very uh, derogatory, but in a way, it's like a robot watching robots sometimes. But however, I mean, uh, the style that uh, Huster seems to have here, sometimes it it it, it has a. Uh, a very acceptable way from the judge's point of view because they're familiar with that and it's very easy to uh, to study as far as being uh, you know pressing the points agreed yes Schwartz trying to get forward but getting picked off here by Huster who's very very clever at uh, maintaining the gap he's got longer arms than Schwartz and uh, well he used them to very good effect as I say, I'm glad he's actually cleaned up his act here because he, he did look, um, to, you know, I'm not, not trying to sweep my words here, he looked ridiculous in Atlanta with that very praying mantis kind of style. <laughs> and uh, Jim Brady and I had, uh, oh, we had hoots about Huster. Again, he seems to have the perfect style to, that suits the judges' the way of viewing fights because he doesn't exert himself too much. When he does land, it seems to be very uh, to the target. And it, anyone it, sitting at home there listening to your voice will wonder how you ever got the chance to fight for Britain in the 1992 games. Tell us about it. Uh, obviously, having been the first crit criteria, you have to be a, a British citizen. Secondly, you have to at least complete on a, on a top level, in which I actually won the national championships, and I represented Great uh, England in several internationals. And the criteria at that particular time for myself. Great Britain no longer can select the national team to go to compete in the Olympics anymore. The box actually has to uh, qualify himself to the, the designated qualifying tournaments, in which the welterweights, the light welterweights, and the junior middleweights in in my in my division at the time, which I was selected the welterweight, had to compete in uh, San Pellegrino, Italy. And uh, the first uh, five positions were then allocated towards the Olympics. So in, in fact, all the best welterweights and the best light welterweights and the best light middleweights were actually competing against each other and the first five will go. And that's hence how you uh, qualified basically on your own, not because of your, uh, your country selected you. Their only selection was to enable you to get to that qualifying tournament. So there we are. 4-1, Falk Costa win, uh, leads after two. And uh, how to qualify for the Olympic Games the hard way from Adrian Dodson. Nice left hook there by Schwartz. In a way, the qualifying tournaments in, in, for a European, it's kind of unfair because you still have a uh, very powerful nation like the United States having to be able to select their own national teams. Cuba can select their own national teams. And uh, other, other continents have to go according to uh, the quotas. Why that is, I'm not quite certain because uh, the way boxing is now, no one particular country stands out anymore. Well, the Americans, of course, uh, are having the worst decade in their history as far as producing top-class uh, boxers is concerned. The exactly. Cubans, of course, you know, those old Cubans not getting any younger. So this third round, Huster in the black and white trunks, red vest. 
just sticking to the game plan here. But uh, there's been some pretty nice work from Leonid Schwartz on occasion, getting through with that left hook of his. Very safety conscious, safety first approach by um, <coughs> Huster. Doesn't get too involved, just do just enough, just to land those clean, effective punches that is very visible by the judges. How did you feel about wearing a head guard? Ah, it, uh, you know, it was mandatory, so it, it, bear, it bear no difference. Having boxed in the United States, that was mandatory, so it became basically part of the repertoire. In fact, actually having the first professional fight, it felt kind of funny. But had something on your head. But contrary to, to the popular consensus that uh, it actually is, it helps protect. In the amateur, particularly with the top ten head guards, you actually get cut pretty nasty on the inside because of the lining of the head guard itself and it's meant to be protecting you from that it also makes your head a much more larger, tar large, larger target Does you, did it make you complacent as well more more apt to take punches at, at times at times especially if desperation sets in or you know anxiety where you felt that you needed to do you felt that your head was protected and therefore you can uh, you engage in more uh, taking chances anyway let's get back to this boxing after three rounds Falcusta unsurprisingly 8-1 in front on the judges' scorecards. Once again, the score not reflecting those good left hooks from Schwartz on the replay. Two or three times, that left hook clattered against the right-hand side of Huster's jaw. I think also, in my opinion, there, there tend to be a sincere admiration on the judges' part of especially countries such as German, because they, they seem to have the, the computer's way of fighting very uh, down pack, as you can see, it, it clearly reflects in the scoring. Mm -hmm. I mean, significantly, I don't think he's done that anything spectacular. He is ahead in the fight, he has been landing more cleaner punches, but, uh, you know, sometimes they have a tendency to have a, a more admiration for certain specific countries in the way in which they uh, adapt to the computer system scoring. All of this just my opinion, that is. Well, it's a very valid one, of course. A lot of people would agree with you. The Germans seem to have got this style absolutely right down to uh, a fine art. You know, I recalled but also... Is it boxing? Well, it's... Uh, it's, it's, how can I say, I guess you can say in the legal term it's de facto boxing. Okie dokie. You know, I recall several times in a training camp, England training squad, when we were had to view, uh, you know, international bouts for, of, uh, you know, potential uh, uh, boxers. We actually were advised to look at certain boxers from Germany that emphasized that the best way of fighting towards the computer. And boxing with style such as, uh, Huster was a prime example, right. believe it or not. Yes, I can believe that. So this fourth round then, once again, Leonid Schwartz trying to go forward here, has landed a couple of nice looking punches, but uh, all the way, once again, Huster very much in control here. And uh, I wouldn't say that Huster's even had a first gear, Adrian, would you? No. Uh, on the other hand, Swartz seemed to be doing a lot of uh, upper body movement, but nothing seemed to be landing, not getting close enough to land those punches. Of course, we do have a regular faithful band of uh, viewers in Israel. Nice to see them with three qualifiers. In fact, they've done very well because the qualifying is exceptionally tough this year. It is. Uh, they make it very stringent, especially with uh, reducing the quotas as well as uh, increasing the rounds. So I'm quite certain they probably have it much more stringent now. So 9-1 then after, th after four rounds, one round to go. And of course, the old system, you wouldn't know who was in front at this stage. Of course, a lot of people could have a pretty pretty mean guess, yeah. but uh, no one would know for sure. And uh, everyone, of course, now does know that Huster's a mile in front. There, I mean, that was quite, that was a clean right hand at the uh, uh, Swatch land. And I'm, I'm not certain whether that uh, three judges saw that all at the same time. So Leonid Schwartz then from Israel, been boxing for eight years, Huster's been boxing for 14. And you can see in the German corner, the master, uh, the coach Kruger, he's been around with a lot of the best, a yeah. lot of the current top professionals. 
So he knows, he, he schooled those, those uh, up-and-coming German amateur boxers exactly how they need to fight in order to get uh, the best results. Absolutely. So Karl Heinz Kruger then responsible, in fact, for people like Falk Huster. Very successful trainer over the years. Fifth and final round then. Swartz having all the work to do now. He's got a huge hill to climb. Absolutely. And we've often found that that uh, a two or three point gap has been almost impossible to close with a round to go. Yeah, especially in the last round. It seems like once they've established momentum, and they keep it that way. Three, 13 fighters, by the way, from Britain represented in these European Championships. Five from Scotland, four from Ireland. My apologies, five from England, four from Scotland, three from Ireland, and one from Wales. And a rotten draw for the Welshman. I give Swartz of Israel full points for his effort. I mean, he seems to desperately try. Yes, he's up against the absolute master of his art here in Falkhusta. One of two boxing brothers. The other one, of course, also qualified for these uh, European Championships. You know, it's really, it's really so weird sometimes, especially for me now, looking at guys who are considered the absolute cream of the crop and masters at this way of fighting computer. You know, they seem to have no finesse. They seem to have no style. It's just a, a way of mastering the computer system. And it makes you think, I could get in there and do these guys in no time. Wow, if you can go back and redo it, you know. So it's all over now. They bother shouting and uh, undoubtedly, yeah, well, there you are. 10-1. So anyway, 10-1 to Falkluster. Well, whether that's a true re reflection or not, of course, um, is it all a matter of opinion. We felt personally that uh, Schwartz deserved a better shake than that, didn't you? Oh, most certainly. I mean, I saw he land one clean shot prior to landing the other. The last clean shot he was registered for. There you go. You can see clearly he just landed a, a, a decent left hook. Followed by a right. Slightly short right, but it's still got through. There's no credit for aggression. There's no credit for effort, as it was before. So Falk Huster then declared the winner, and he goes forward. These, of course, the prelim bouts of these European Championships, and uh, Falk Huster, unsurprisingly, a pretty clear winner there against uh, Leonid Schwartz. So to come tonight, the lightweights, we have a man from Ireland by the name of McEnany in action. Eugene McEnany against Robert Masik from Hungary. Stay here. Masik of Hungary. Nice and tall McEnany, 26 years of age. 40 wins in 60 bouts, twice a national champion. A coach by... Uh, Harry Hawkins and Denali Anthony. So there's the Hungarian, Robert Macic. He's 22, winner of 57 of his 87, runner-up in the Hungarian Championships. So round one, and uh, this Irish boxer, McInerney, Southpaw. Well, a scoring blow yet to land. They're both very long, long rangey yeah. way of fighting. Yes, and uh, at the moment, well, you say long range, way, <laughs> long range fighters. Not a single scoring blow has landed yet. Of course, neither man wishing to overcommit themselves in these early stages and make mistakes. But I think they're taking that to the limit, really, Adrian, aren't they? And sometimes, you know, there, there, there's so much pressures on both fighters and uh, having so much on the line. Europe, having been the European Championship, they both want to look good. Sometimes committing themselves the first few minutes of the first round, uh, it's not so much of a big deal. Well, quite obviously, McEnany is a counter-puncher. He's waiting.
for Magic to uh, to lead off and try and counter over the top. But I've got a feeling that this Hungarian is quite a smart fighter. Of course, there's uh, been nothing out of Hungary since the great Laszlo Pap. Well, nothing to that level anyway. Yeah. McEnany, if I said that correctly, he seems to be a freak at the weight. He's very tall, very rangy. Yes, this is the 60 kilogram maximum weight in this division. And it does look like McEnany now just getting out sped here by Masik. They both are extremely tentative this late in the first round. Well, then, well, not surprisingly, well, there wasn't much in that one, but uh, I reckon, yeah, Masik is uh, one point in front. Hardly surprising, as I say. So, Eugene McInerney, twice the national champion. I recall uh, back in the days when we were fighting against any Hungarian, the emphasis was always to go out and take the initiative. Having the um, the gentleman that was the head of the, he was very influential man from Hungary under Aiva. I, I do. We all call him the man with shades. Uh, having you, you had to do good against his fighters, or else you find yourself whether you win or not, you were on the losing side. Mm -hmm. I think his name. Uh, I can't remember. Emil something. We all call him the man with shades. Very influential man. I don't know what he is now. He possibly could be the IEB president. I don't know. <laughs> oh, well, the less said about him, then the better. <laughs> Round two, then, of the scheduled five in the lightweight division. Just to remind you, Eugene McEnany in the red vest from Ireland in action here against Robert Masik of Hungary. Masik won the first, 1 0 officially. It's very good. On the other hand, you know, these boxers being highlighted on Eurosport, it goes out throughout Europe. And, uh, you know, to get an opportunity to have other boxers, you know, it gives the sport, uh, you know, a chance to be on the uh, international circuit. You know, having gone down in, in the Belgium, so to speak, for a little bit, it's a good exposure for these guys. Yes, and I hope that the, uh, the organizers of this event don't do anything daft and uh, hijack it and uh, be remembered for all the wrong reasons. Please, we, we won't want to speak too fast now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, give them time. Might it's only come day back. one. Might come back to haunt us. <laughs> Slightly better around this for, for uh, McEnany. He got through with a, a good three-punch combination. Unfortunately, I think it's the only thing he's done so far in this second round. But it is a close round. There's very little between them, although on that occasion, Magic did score, and again... With a jarring punch too, so they most likely three judges will have captured that on a computer. I've noticed the, the last three uh, fights we've commentated, very few body shots have been thrown. Yes, it's like it's non-existent anymore. Absolutely. But a couple of good rights there from uh, Magic as we end round three. And it's going to be, well, sorry, round two. Well, I'm very, very surprised. <laughs> Eugene McEnany on the scorecard there. Um, undoubtedly, he landed a couple of punches, but uh, I must admit, I thought that Magic did enough to have... A bigger lead than the one point. Yeah, I assume that too, I agree. I thought it was at least five points there. There's a lot of jarring head movements. Let's see if we can see a decent bit of work here from McEnany. Again, um, Massey landed some very clean shots that jarred uh, McEnany's head back. You One would assume that, uh, based on the scoring and what they're looking for, that that would have landed. So there's Eugene then. Very relaxed. He looks very composed. This is his first tilt at the European Championships as we go into round three.
Whatever happened to the um, the Cuban uh, coach that was coaching the Irish team for a while? That's a good question. <laughs> Don't know the answer, I'm afraid, Adrian. <laughs> I dare say we'll find out, though, before the end of the week. I mean, it's only a natural question to ask. Having, yes, yeah. Having had quite a good success with Wayne McCullough and... Um, and uh, Michael Carruth. Michael Carruth, when he was appointed. That's right. In the 92 it. game. They also had a few qualifiers for Atlanta. More, in fact, than uh, England. Wow. So he'd obviously done them some good. I wonder what would happen if every nation in Europe employed a Cuban coach. I guess we all learn Spanish. <laughs> nice answer. At least you learn to say como se llama. What's your name? All right. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the contest, um, the Hungarian boxer seems to be very much on top. He's landing the more effective punches. He's ahead at the moment. McInerney seems to be boxing as a, a, a boxing with the ability of a fighter who seems to be like he's ahead. Yes, or just not finding the room to get his own punches in. Um, this Hungarian is very snappy. Maybe he's thinking too much. You never know. Sometimes Quite possibly, yeah tend to think too much and actually let the major take his course and, and it's the, the kind of fight isn't it where at the end of it you stamp your foot and say i wish i could have did that all over yeah. again now yeah. what i would have could have should have yeah, exactly. i didn't and also these two lads look uh, unusually thin don't they yeah. for their size again diet nutrition and you know possibility of uh, them being enforced in a certain way you never know right who won that one? 5-3 now for Magic. He's increasing on the scorecards, the Irishman. He's, that m he's not that much significantly in front, um, Mask. Yeah, Magic is not... Uh, no, I mean, he's still catchable, isn't he? Yes. With two rounds to go. I mean, it's open for either fighter. So once again, a touch of replay here from that round. Well, McInerney, they're scoring quite well with that right hand. A long hook. And also shoving Magic back there. I think McInerney being a south boy is maybe having a little problem getting inside of uh, the orthodox style of uh, Masic. He, he seems, seems to be a conflict of styles here. South boy against an orthodox, which can present uh, quite a few problems, especially with uh, McInerney's feet. If you, you notice, his feet seem to be out of place. Yes, they're fundamental errors made by boxers at this level. And really, that they should be avoided. I mean, the problem McInerney has, he has got no lateral movement here. He's, he's completely in one solid line, isn't he? Certainly, certainly. Um, you know, he really needs to shiv off to his own right and try and land a right hook or a jab and just stay round on his right-hand side and completely nullify that right hand of the Hungarian. But, of course, he's not doing that at all. If anything, in fact, he's moving the wrong way. Yeah. Not just a straight line. He's moving to the actual punch he's been getting caught with for the exactly. last two rounds. Exactly. And there he goes again. The left, the right hand. And, of course, we're all born with a, with a particular bias, aren't we? You know, one... You know, we're all born with a certain speed and rhythm. We're all born with a certain way of answers. We either lean to the right, lean to the left. And, of course, it looks like uh, McEnany's leaning, born leaning the wrong way, really. <laughs> Especially for this fight. As you could say, his natural bias is to his own left, isn't it? Yeah. They call it the preferred mode. Certainly preferred, I think, by uh, Magic. Maybe it's all part of a strategy as well, moving to his left. Maybe they've seen him fight in previous contests and realize he's, he's less effective moving to his, uh, his right. Well, I think the evidence, uh, the evidence shows that that's not actually true. Another thing, of course, is, is, um, is McInerney really a southpaw? Is he a left-handed man? To, is he a right-handed southpaw? Con converted out to that, yeah. Well, I guess we'll never know, unless we ask him himself. Whatever way, he needs to do a lot more than he's doing now. Absolutely right. Shame, really. Ireland, one of uh, 
McAnally, one of three Irish qualifiers. They're both getting a little ragged this round. Well, that was nice by Eugene. Nice timing there by McEnany as the bell ends round four. Good combination from him landing. Well, that's very, very wow. interesting now. McEnany leading 7-6. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? McEnany actually won four points in that round and uh, Magic won one. one. <laughs> it does get very laughable on occasion, doesn't it? It is very much so. Do you think that was a fair re reflection? Was that a 4-1 round a fair reflection? No, I thought it was uh, maybe even the most. You know, I thought, uh, you know, Masik landed a couple of clean shots that maybe merited a couple of points. Anyway, we'll not uh, harp on about that too much. If we continue like this, we most likely get mentally irregular trying to figure out who's on top and who's yes. not. So, fifth and final round then, and the Irishman McEnany will have been told, hey, you're winning. Don't <laughs> blow it. <laughs> you know, it's funny, but this, uh, this scoring actually... Uh, reconfirm the old adage that they always say you know in boxing one minute when you can be top seed and the next you fertilizer <laughs> very good one that's a nice uh, a nice saying there that was a cleaned up version i'm glad to say <laughs> <laughs> at least it's much more polite than vinny pazenza once said after our contest when he was when he was victorious he said uh, i hit him with the right hand and his legs turned to spaghetti and i was like the sauce all over him <laughs> <laughs> good old vinny what a character. We're missing a few of that in the amateurs as well. A couple yep. of, I mean, they're, they're guys who had style. I remember the, you know, Constantine Chu. He, he always skipped over the ropes and jumped in. And uh, when he threw certain punches and he landed effective, he knew they scored. He would stand back and admire that and, you know, caught the judges out. They all love that. Oh, sure. Of course, the uh, the judges hate it. Well, in fact, the, the administrators hate it, don't they? Because it... Uh, it makes this sport slightly interesting. And there were a couple of other guys from the African nation, such as um, uh, Anthony Wamba and uh, the late uh, Robert Wangila, when they when their name were introduced in the corners, they came out and they do that sort of a, a native dance. Mm -hmm. You know, it was really funny to watch. Those are the days. <laughs> anyway, we've got Eugene McInerney here in the red vest, still protecting a one-point lead in this final round. But the big question is, has Robert Machik done enough to peg him back? <coughs> or will we see McEnany advance to the next stage? It's anyone's, isn't it, Adrian? Up for grabs at the moment. I would be extremely surprised if uh, punches are scored here because uh, it's very difficult for a three judges to see who's landing what. Nice Great work right though by McEnany and suddenly he's got this Hungarian where he wants him. He's got him exchanging blows and of course that's all that Magic can really hope to do. He's got a point to make up and he's doing everything he can to do that and that's playing right into Eugene's hands and it's all over now. Well McEnany retains that lead at the end of five rounds. McEnany goes forward. He One wins 8-7. And uh, I tell you something, I'm fairly delighted. Yeah, great for the Irish team. Great for the Irish team. So that's uh, an excellent start then. Eugene McEnany setting the standard for the Irish to follow. Winning by one point. And bad luck. On to Robert Matchick. On afterthought, he actually, um, he, he really worked aggressively in the last couple of rounds to pull it out, so. Well done then. So Eugene McEnany winning. He's, uh, he's going to go through the quarterfinals. So, still to come then, we move up a division to the light welterweights, and we have Sergei Baikowski from Belarus, the home nation, against Ali Akrayov of Germany. Stay here. And a half kilograms, 10 stone in English money.
And we've got a man from Belarus. There he is, the local man in action against a man from Germany. This is Ali Akrayov in the blue corner. Well, with a name like Ali, he's got to do good here. He's got to be German, isn't name. he? <laughs> so the German in the blue corner, Akrayov against Baikovsky of Belarus. Baikovsky, by the way, 25 years of age, 170 victories in 196 bouts. That's good form. A whole lot of experience. And he's been the Belarus champion from 1990 to the current day. Bronze medal winner of the European Championship in 1996 in Denmark. Also boxed in the uh, Atlanta Olympics. And, uh, well, Ali Akrayov is uh, one of the youngest competitors, only 19, 43 wins in 48 matches. And uh, he got the silver medal in the European Junior Championships last year. So there's some quality in the ring there, but you've got to really fancy Bajkowski, haven't you? And he seems to have all the uh, essential experience and experience that goes with it. Yep, Southpaw as well to boot. He seems a very strong guy too. Yeah. Bajkowski going forward, looking for openings. Seems very powerful in the way in which he, you know, he has his stance. And then obviously with the heavier weight, you come a lot more heavier punching. Sure. <clears throat> Both boxers are looking for that opening at the moment. That's ironic. Another south four with the wrong way of moving. You know, it's actually amazing. Sometimes in the first couple of minutes in the amateur bout, you actually weigh up everything that you've been studying based on the guy's style against what's actually in front of you. So for the first few seconds, you actually be boxing against the guy you've been studying and the guy that's actually in front of you. Ooh, on the back Ooh. of the head then from Bajkowski. Don't turn around, he says to young Akrayov of Germany. Very sporting. Uh, Akrayov didn't start boxing until he was 14. But that's it, five years. And Bajkowski's, well, he's been boxing since uh, he was 13. That's 12 years ago. He got caught coming in with the right hand from uh, Akarov. I think I'll... I refrain from saying Akarov, I use the first name Ali. Yes, I think that's a very good idea. Well, that's <laughs> the end of round one, and uh, Bajkowski, the, uh, the crowd's favourite, winning by one point to nil. Looks like a very significantly small arena for a, a major competition like the European Championships. Unfortunately, it's very hard to attract fans to amateur boxing these days and when you're going to look at the ABA championships that take place in England every year you know I mean the, the the presence at the final I mean you could really say there was two 250 people really yes yeah. I mean even the average uh, guy who not really an avid boxing fan obviously you generally have an awareness when the final is around sure. Wembley is advertised national TV all changed basically went unnoticed this year all changed and I'm a very regular visitor at some amateur boxing shows, namely the Watford Boxing Club, Callahan Amateur Boxing Club, Bushy Boxing Club, go down to Rose Hill and uh, to Woking, various places like that. And all of these tiny little club shows are immensely well supported. And it's only when you get to this level that people seem to think, what's the point in going? <laughs> Rather curious. Well, it's yeah. also curious, Steve, let's face it, you are regular at most boxing shows. Well, that's a fact, <laughs> I'm a boxing junkie. <laughs> <laughs> so round two, then, of this uh, light welterweight. I wish some folks is as dedicated as yourself, then they'll have a better knowledge of the in in intricate details of the game and the sport. Well, thank you, Adrian. <laughs> you can come again. <laughs> Said in sincere words. <laughs> no flattery. <laughs> I've got a feeling, um, 
that this young man from Germany, this uh, Ali Akarov, is a very attractive boxer. Um, and he's got the scope, hasn't he, to, to develop. He's, he looks very nice. In fact, he looks a whole lot better um, aesthetically yeah. um, than the man from Belarus. He's just been caught there at a good right hand. <laughs> the WWF there. <laughs> I think they call that the suplex, don't they? A rolling spin. All right. Referee seems very animated there. Yes, they like to make a meal of things. Yeah, sometimes to exaggerate too much, in my opinion. Double left hand from Akarov, and then a right to the body. But uh, you're dead right about this uh, this man from Belarus. He he does look immensely strong in comparison, doesn't yeah. he? Looks very aggressive. And boxing, I would have thought not at his natural weight Ooh. oh good shot great right hand that's a sweeping uh, left cross wasn't it i think uh, the breakfast punch right on the money <laughs> well akarov did well to get up from that one so quickly he's got his wits about him and there's the bell to prevent the follow-up so that's going to be you know I ironically there's no extra points for knockdowns in this no. game anymore no just a 3-1 lead which in it, uh, uh, Ali has a chance to get himself back into the picture. I mean, he's not that s significant lead ahead uh, by Kovsky. Here we go again. Watch this. Beautiful Bang. left hand, kind of left hand right on the chin. Good shot. He's now getting up from that. You saw the look of disappointment on his trainer's face as he hit the floor. So when the body says, oh, I've never experienced that feeling, I won't want to, but... Uh, the, the head is saying, I got to get up, man. But the leg is saying, man, that's you and your job. <laughs> did you stay down? Uh, did you go down very often? I've never been down. Amateur or professional. Nah, I won't like to go down either. If you want to know what it's like, tell you later. Oh, you felt it a couple of times <laughs> in the gym. I mean, you, you get stunned a few times, so you know what that is. It's like going swimming. You can't go swimming without getting water in here. <laughs> It's like diving into an empty pool. <laughs> Round three, then. These two light water weights, 10 stone, 63.5 kilograms. Is there any other way of saying it? Yes, light welterweight. <laughs> light welterweight or a junior welterweight, as they say in the United States. 140 pounds. Well, it's actually 139 in the amateurs okay. and 140 in professionals. <laughs> it's really it, it confusing sometimes. I even get confused myself. My old weight, as a matter of fact. Absolutely. Well, we were all light welterweights at some point in our lives, weren't we? <laughs> <laughs> Just <laughs> for me, it was so much more, so much longer ago. Well, we've got this. Uh, Belarusian on the march now, trying to hunt down this German and looking very aggressive, obviously looking to force a stoppage here. He's obviously the much more stronger puncher and he throws his punches with very serious intent as well. Yes, I think the, the main aim here is to prevent Akarov from getting over the effects of that knockdown and getting himself into this round yes. because it's a pivotal point in the fight when you think about it. If Akarov has a good session here, he's got chances. Yes. And that's exactly what this uh, this lad from Belarus is trying to prevent. And he's actually still in contention here. I mean, he's thrown, he's landed a few clean punches oh. that I've seen. Obviously, just taking one himself. But you never know how it's been scored. That's right. Sergei Baikovsky. Oh, once again, a lovely shot there and a tumble. Quite a dramatic tumble coming from Ali Akarov there from a lovely left cross. Well placed, well timed. And you got caught right on the button, moving at the same time. Yes. So, he's going to continue once again, this young man. Again, saved by the bell. Yeah, from Germany, and the, and the knockdown came at exactly the same, same. time as he did in the previous round. Well, 6-1 now to Bajkowski. And That's probably a true reflection, wouldn't you say? Yes, certainly. He's being dominated at the moment. Mm -hmm. can see a replay here. So watch this right again. Hand. Bang. It wasn't particularly um, flush. He got caught on the move at the same time. Sure. Yeah, no balance there. 
they do shout down to the boot, Steve. They do, don't they? You being a boxer, you should know. No, an ex-boxer. It was so long ago, I've forgotten what it feels like. <laughs> you never forgot what you felt it. <laughs> yeah, maybe you're right. Unless you choose to have selective memory, that is. My brain tends to switch off <laughs> when it comes to remembering pain. Actually, funny, the funny thing is, when you get knocked over, it's the, it, they're the punches that don't hurt. Yeah. It's the ones that keep you up that hurt. Anyway, here we go then, four. Round four. Um, it's been an interesting match, this one. Young man from Germany looking to make his mark at only 19 years of age. And uh, recently made the transition into the senior ranks. This, of course, the senior European Championships. He was runner-up in the junior version. You notice uh, Bajkowski came out this round just totally elusive. Boxing, trying to box and stay away now. He obviously has been told that he's way ahead. Mm -hmm. Yes, just wants to avoid any conflict here. Akarov from Wiesbaden in Germany. And uh, Bajkowski from a place called Vitebsk in Belarus. Probably not how you say it. <laughs> Again, uh, he got caught a couple of times there, but uh, Bajkowski seems to be uh, much more on a defensive this round. Does he look like your idea of a gold medal winner, Bajkowski? Well, he sure demonstrated a few of the effectiveness that uh, the judges were looking for. And his way of fighting, he's strong. And he, he seems to have a very difficult style. Very long, very rangy, hits very hard, and that goes a long way. Sure. What we're going to try and do um, over the next, well, in fact, over the next 24 hours, is sift through all of the entrants and try and come up with some idea of the medalist at the end of all this. Um, it'll be the dodson Holdsworth list of uh, potential medal winners. I think that's probably the best name to give it. Yeah. That, um, that's very much going to be open for scrutiny. Yeah. And let's just see how far we get, as once again. Not a bad round there from Akarov. In fact, he's, uh, he's picked up a point there. 7-2 now. Yes, yeah, so we'll be trying to work out, as I say, um, just exactly where the, all the big prizes are going to go. We did that, by the way, in Atlanta. Um, <laughs> of course, you sat in with me in Atlanta on yes, a couple of occasions. And um, I'm glad to say we were a million miles away, <laughs> or I was a million miles away from what actually happened. A touch more replay there, very uh, smart moves coming from the man from Belarus. I'm sure that the German uh, coaches will be advising him as of his uh, current standing as far as the uh, scores are concerned. Well, let's face it, for this young man, only 19 years of age, this is a bad experience. It's not, they, they probably didn't want, wouldn't want him to win the tournament at this point, would they? Yeah. As a 19 year old. He needs to get the experience under his belt. He seems to have very good leg movements, very good lateral movements. He's got some a good shift, upper body movements. He's a tidy fighter. Yeah. I like the look of this German, I must admit. Uh, he, you know, aesthetically, he's... Uh, he is the business, whereas yeah. I'm afraid um, Bajkowski um, is a bit of an untidy-looking fighter, isn't he? Yeah, and boxing is all about styles. Maybe his style complements other other styles of fighting rather than uh, Bajkowski's, who seems to be a very strong, very straight, down-the-line puncher. Again, here he comes. He's an aggressive right hand that has been successful in the first few rounds. Full marks to Akarov. He's actually going for it here. Of course, he does need the knockout to win. Being 7-2 behind with one round to play. Yeah. I guess also it's been a great adjustment for many of the guys involved in the competition who's been boxing at three rounds beforehand. Because obviously being three rounds, they have a, a time limitation to evaluate their performance. And then having to go five too many rounds, so, you know, it's, it's so many adjustments and so many changes in a short period of time. Yes, what I'd like to see happen is, well, it's already happened, there's been breakaways, of course, in, in, in Britain, in, uh, in Wales, well, in, in England, Wales and Scotland, 
Um, there are more than one attempt at a ruling body, and it's put the, the sport into chaos. As usual, the same old story, trying to have more chieftain Indians. It's the old, the old administration, though, that needs to go, and the new ones to take over, but of course that hasn't happened yet. Still a massive split. I think, in my opinion, the great disappointment, especially in boxing in Great Britain as a whole, we have so much talent and so much guys who have the ability to be gold medalists yep. in major championships, but not being given the opportunity, you know, on a level playing field to execute that, that ability, as well as, you know, the financial backing that many other, you know, you know, successful nations have, such as Cuba and Germany. You know, they have the Bundesliga in Germany. They have, they have, you know. The Cuban national team is basically they're able to be full-time boxers and have to worry about expenses. I mean, there's so many uh, tangibles t to do with, especially boxing in Great Britain. Right, so 9-3 then in favor of Sergei Baikovsky. There you are. And, uh, well, I don't think that um, Ali Akarov should feel too bad about that. Of course, he's going to be very disappointed but he shouldn't be, feel too bad. And that brings us almost to the end of our coverage, our first day from Belarus, from Minsk, in fact. And uh, we hope you've enjoyed the coverage. Um, we've got more for you tomorrow night. We've got the welters, we've got the middleweights, we've got the light middleweights and the light heavyweights. More prelim contests to come for you. My name's Steve Holter. As I say, I hope you've enjoyed it. And I'm delighted to say I've been joined by Adrian Dodson. Say goodnight, Adrian. And good night, everyone. <laughs> hope you enjoyed the contest. More to come. Yes, we'll be with you all this week, and we hope you have your company tomorrow night here on Eurosport. Good night. Yeah, hi, it's a pleasure being here again. Faster this evening, we'll take in the welterweight division, the light middleweights, the middleweights, and the light heavyweights. And our first round this evening is between a man from Denmark. No, it's not. We are from Denmark. We have a man by the name of Christian Blatt. Solomon. A few variations on the spelling, by the way, of what I have and what uh, they have. This, of course, like every other bout here this evening, scheduled for five two-minute rounds, which is the new international distance. Come yeah. on, then. Latin and Denmark in the red corner, red strip against this man from Norway. And, of course, the other thing here is a massive... Scandinavian rivalry between these two, Denmark against Norway. Adrian, early thoughts? Um, Vlad looks very strong. Seems to be uh, very uh, elusive on his legs. So Vlad from Denmark is in the blue corner. Three years of age, good record, 110 wins in 135 outings. That's very good. Okay, one, two, one, two. Well, you sound check okay. Um, this is very awkward, actually. You
Well, I'm terribly sorry about that. You've just joined us when we've had a few technical problems here from Belarus in uh, Minsk in Belarus, I should say. My name's Steve Holsworth, with me, Adrian Dodson, and we are on day two of our coverage of the European Championships. In the blue corner, we have the Norwegian by the name of... And uh, some of these names are very hard to get hold of. Elamari Soliman. He's boxing a man from Denmark by the name of Christian Blatt. And Blatt in the red corner, there he is. Touch of replay here from round one. And the score you will see come up at the end of each completed round, and of course at the start of the next round. And we, f we thought, in fact, that uh, Blatt from Denmark looked quite a strong individual in the first round there, Adrian. Yes, uh, going is. forward, catching Solomon with some pretty good-looking punches. But uh, the, the Norwegian quite light on his feet. Yes, very nimble. He moves very elusively. But he got caught a couple of times with that right hand from Blatt. And, of course, the, the qualification um, has been pretty tough this year. In fact, this year, it only happens every two years, of course, the Europeans. Now you'll see the man from Denmark, Blatt, one point up. Round two, then, of the scheduled five twos. And if you've just joined us, I'm delighted to say I'm accompanied by Adrian Dodson, former ABA champion, twice an Olympian, and, of course, challenger for the WBO Light Middleweight Championship. And I apologise for those sound problems at the beginning of the show. So this uh, Danish boxer in the red, looking altogether too strong at the moment for Slyman of Norway. Slyman, by the way, one of two qualifiers for the Norwegians, and uh, Blatt, one of four for Denmark. Blatt, 23 years of age, Slyman just 21, and Blatt's record is very impressive, 110 victories and 135 outings. Once again, looking to put the pressure on Slyman here. He's very successful with his right hand, Blatt, of Denmark, he's consistent with that, he's catching um, Slyman with that right hand consistently. And Elamari Solomon, by the way, a gold medalist in the Norway Cup. Not surprisingly, I'm not trying to say there was anything uh, biased about that result, but he is, of course, from Norway. 75 wins and 101 outings. Nice right there again from Blatt. I like this gentleman, Blatt. He seems to be very aggressive, very precise with his punching. Works both the body and head very effectively. Once again, a very sparse crowd in this arena. And, of course, the wonderful thing about uh, eliminating championships like this is the action gets better as it goes on. Of course, we're at the last 16 here. And this, by the way, the welterweight division, 10 and a half stone, 67 kilograms, 147 pounds. I must say, Blatt is one of the better box I've seen so far. Seems to have everything down very uh, compact. Good defense, good offense. Yep, good round there once again for Blatt, I do believe. In fact, now, re registered on the scorecard, 2-0. If you're wondering what on earth this is all about, if you've been on some other planet for the last five or six years, um, I will remind you that uh, any of the, any three of the five judges at ringside must, within one second of each other, press a red or a blue button to register a point landing. The highest and lowest scores are discarded, and the remaining three uh, are all sorted out by a computer, and they come up with the score. So, although it sounds ridiculous that you can land three or four punches, and everyone can clearly see it, and you go back to your corner without a point, bear in mind there are very few bad decisions at this level, even with this very controversial system in place. Would that, you agree with that? No, most certainly. Most certainly. Blatt, I, I really like what I see so far in Blatt. He's uh, very composed, very consistent, and he's working the body and the head very effectively. So round three then of the scheduled five, and uh, this lad from Norway has got some work to do. He's uh, actually using the perimeter of the ring very well, but uh, unfortunately at the moment he's been forced on the defensive, and as I say that, suddenly he starts coming back. So I think it's Solomon of Norway, 21 years of age, in the blue strip. 
He's been he's beginning to kind of very effectively now, Salomon. That's right. He's now got Blatt under some kind of pressure. That's the first time in the bout that that's happened. And of course he has to. There's no doubt about that. Yes, most certainly. He's uh, beginning to show a variety. Both boxes are showing a variety of punching. And it's the 22nd European Championship. And this is a very nice looking bout. In fact, they could be two pros, couldn't they, when you yes, think about it? I was actually just thinking the same thing. They're both very, uh, you know, skilled. They both, um, they're trying to think at the same time while they're boxing, so which is very nice to see. Yes, of course, at this level, it's normally an awful thrash, isn't it, over two minutes? And, yes. uh, but as you say, they are, they are thinking kind of fighters. And, of course, all of the purists who uh, follow amateur boxing will curse me for calling them fighters. Of course, they're not fighters, are they? They're boxers. They're boxers, yeah. And this is about not a fight. It may not be here. But we're not going to criticize amateur boxing too much because this, this promises to be a, probably the best European yeah. championship we've had for quite some time. Hopefully it'll live up to that expectation. I, I mean, certainly hope so. What we're looking at tonight, this is, is a, a much improved uh, level of competition that we've seen so far with these two boxers. Well, that's not a bad round at all from uh, from Solomon. He might have nicked, well, well, there you are. Blatt, in fact, uh, gets another couple of points on, but this time um, Solomon registers his first point. We'll take a short break. <laughs> As you can see there, Christian Blatt from Denmark, a pretty comfortable lead at this stage against the Norwegian by the name of El Amari Soliman. Although, been, four marks it, to Soliman, he came right back very well in round three. Yes, he was very competitive and he seems to be, you know, picking up where he left off now from the third round. It's really nice to see a variety so far from both boxers. They're both working the body and head effectively but are we looking at a possible european champion here in the shape of these two lads at least one of these will go out here anyway yes it's a shame i mean it looks so far it looks like a semi-finals or final match between two very good well-skilled competitive boxers who seem to be putting everything on the line and gambling at that too but so far uh, bland seems to be the more uh, superior boxer He's on top at the moment, and he looked potentially as like a gold medalist, in my opinion. Yes, he certainly punches hard enough to get Solomon's respect. And I suppose that at this level, you need to be able to hit, don't you? Yes, most certainly. And you also need to have that little ability he's, he's demonstrating, that thinking ability to change and, you know, add some variety. So Christian Black there in the red, showing all it takes to possibly get himself in the medals, and even, who knows, top of the tree. Again, Salomon is back on that uh, the lateral movement. He was more effectively when he was standing there and trading punches. Him being behind also, he's, he has all the work to do, so he needs to uh, get a few landing scorn shots. Beautiful left hand there. Yes, I've got a feeling it won't be too long before Christian Black, regardless of the outcome of these European championships, boxes professionally. Although, to be honest, you know, it's difficult. They don't have that in Denmark and Norway. And in fact, most of Scandinavia is a non-professional zone. 5-1 now with four gone. And that's probably a true reflection of what we've seen, don't you, wouldn't you think? Yes, yeah, so far it was a little bit uh, harsh in uh, Salomon. I think he did a little bit more than uh, just one punch that landed that scored so far. So, judge of replay then from round four. That's a lovely right hook there from Solomon. And again, a, a nice right there catching Blatt. Excellent. And of course, the, the last European champions were held in Denmark, the home of Christian Blatt. We've been a bit bereft, by the way, of uh, personal details and uh, career details, so I hope you'll forgive us for that as we come out for the fifth and final round, and this Norwegian, well, looks like he needs a knockout to win now, Adrian. Uh, most certainly. 
He has everything to do. It's all or nothing now, this round. Do you, well, has he taken it a bit too casual, do you think, from the first bell? It's, it's really hard to really criticize him at the moment because, I mean, he actually, I mean, we both agree he's very competitive. They're both demonstrating some very fine boxing skill. And um, it's a shame it's just one punch scored so far for him. Having said that, he still needs to do everything. I mean, you never know it until that bell rings. So was that one punch can change everything. Absolutely. And we've not seen the best of these lads yet either, because that's an, an awful dilemma they're in. Um, they've got possibly four or five fights under their belt. Uh, sorry, my apologies. Stretching ahead of them yes. a, in a very difficult championship, and they don't want to expend an, an awful lot of energy at this stage. They want to do enough to win, um, but not enough to wear themselves out or sustain an injury. Consequently, a very fine line to walk, isn't it? Oh, most certainly. I mean, uh, there's so much uh, variety and so much styles that you know that will be presenting each boxer. I guess, you know, you know, pacing themselves, each one of them, you know, during the tournament will be uh, something that's uh, on the forefront of every one of these boxers' mind. As well as trying not to sustain any major injury. Because there, it seems to be a lot more stringent now as far as injury is concerned, you know. That's right. Yeah, one little knock and that's it, you're out. Even if you've won. Anyway, we're seconds ticking away now to end this uh, welterweight preliminary. This is the last 16. In fact, the prelims all over the last 16. So I'm glad it's been pared down. It's uh, quite a significant drop in numbers have been allowed this year. And that's only good for the sport, I think, because we're getting rid of the cream of the crop of European boxers, aren't we? Yes, we are. I mean, it, it's a very uh, a scaled down process that uh, we had to be able to get to see if they were actually the best. Well, it's all over now, no doubt about the winner in my mind, Christian Blatt, and it looks a very disappointed Norwegian there, propping back to the corner. Yes, at this level, all of the fights are very competitive. You won't get, I mean, forgive me the word, you won't get any ropey fighters here, will you? Oh, no, no. I mean, the process of evaluation is very stringent now. So a touch of replay from that fifth and final round with uh, Elamari Soliman doing all he could, I thought, in round... Four, but he's not going to go any further here. So, here we are. Christian Platt then declared the winner, and that's 7-1. Uh, the way preliminary between here is the man, Chris Bessie from the British Army, three times ABA champion, representing England. And he's in action against another soldier, Kevin Short from Wales, also in the British Army. So these two know each other well, Adrian. Most certainly. And it's, it's also probably a, a very uh, expected match, too, because in the European Championships, it predominantly has a process of, of elimination, pit the British and their Welsh fighters together. It's a real pity, actually. It's yeah. just the luck of the draw. An all South Pole match here, the Welshman in the blue vest. Um, I dare say he mu would have much preferred the red vest, wouldn't he, the Welshman? <laughs> probably would have. Not his night, is it? Anyway, Chris Bessie, good fighter, and I think statistically probably the most successful um, amateur boxer in the British Army for something like about, oh, well, probably this century. Probably one of the most successful bo British amateur boxers ever, too, because yeah, sure. having three British amateur titles. And of course, boxing in your weight. Ah, yeah. I mean, that's a good accomplishment. I mean, has he won all the three championships at the uh, junior middleweight? I uh, yes he has, yeah. yeah. Cuz I remember another a fellow boxer at Kalzaki won it in three different weights sure. or two. Sure. Joe Kalzaki of course won the consecutive uh, ABA championships at different weights. And look what happened to him. Good old Joe, super middleweight champion of course. Messi seems to have a, a very nice in and out movements, nice jab. And these two will have worked very frequently, I, I'm sure, uh, and uh, under Andy Edwards, the army coach, and I've had the pleasure of being involved at A level anyway in some of the army matches recently down at the uh, Woking Amateur Boxing Club. And they're, they're most likely to be very familiar with each other's way of fighting. As well. Oh, absolutely. As you can see, Bessie's about an inch taller, I'd say. Seems to be the stronger of the two, also. Oh. 
you know, also, y there always seems to be an, a, a very competitive edge in British and Welsh fighting. Oh, also. absolutely. There's not going to be much in this one, but I've got a feeling that Bessie is far more computer friendly. Would you say that? He seems that way. His style seems to be down pegged, you know, very tight guard. He also has a, a wealth of international experience. Certainly. In fact, Bessie's record, 60 wins in 80 contests. That's very good form. Uh, but the irony is, uh, Kevin Short, and look, not a single punch been recorded. Um, Kevin Short um, has had an awful lot more fights and a lot more wins. In fact, he's, uh, he's won twice as many fights, in fact, almost three times as many fights as uh, Chris Bessie. 162 wins in 210 outings, and that's very good form. Very good record also. Yes, tra trained by Stephen Lowe's. And, uh, of course, Bessie there, seconded by Ian Irwin. English the English coach. national coach. He's been there a long time, hasn't he? Yes, ever since uh, Kevin Hickey uh, got a post at the, the, uh, the Olympic Committee as technical advisor, he's moved in as a national coach. Too long? Um, I think it, the organization needs a change, in my opinion. A little variety. Mm. Need a Cuban in, should we? Yeah, <laughs> possible. <laughs> Possibly. I mean, you have to look based on the results. Yes, it's a hard job to do, no yeah. doubt about that. And uh, Ian has aged considerably, I think, since he took it on. And, uh, you know, the, the fact is, I mean, you know, England are going through a terrible lull. They need a good performance in these championships, don't they? Yes, they certainly do. I mean, the amateur boxing, especially in Great Britain as a whole, has dropped tremendously. They need to have some kind of a result to uh, help uplift, the, you know, that level of the game. Sure. The amateur uh, boxing. Sure. And, of course, the other main problem for people like Short is that there is a split in the, uh, the Welsh ABA. Now there's two uh, ruling bodies in Wales, there's two ruling bodies in Scotland, um, simply because, you know, a group of people, and I must say I sympathise with them, couldn't get on with the previous administration and thought, right, that's it, we're off, we're going to do it ourselves. Um, something's got to give at one point, Adrian. Most certainly do. I mean, um, the bottom line comes down to if you're not producing the results, it doesn't matter how many organizations you have. It, it reflects in their, uh, the performances. Both these boxers at the moment, you know, it's not much between the two of them. Yes, I agree. But uh, it does look like Bessie's getting the edge at long range here. Not wishing really to get too heavily involved here with Kevin Short. Trying to keep Short, in fact, on the end of that long jab of his. Short's having major problems getting past that uh, right jab. He's well tucked in, uh, Short, and uh, sometimes the judges do tend to look at that. If the punch is not landing cleanly, they won't score. So uh, there is a possibility. I mean, we both saw it at the first round. There was no scoring points. So. But Bessie must be an overwhelming favorite coming into this, surely? Oh, surely. I mean, he's got the world of experience. He's a three-time national champion. And um, he's probably looked at a heavy favorite between the two. Well, Kevin Short making a fight of it here, but once again, it's uh, not exactly one-way traffic, but uh, Bessie, by far the more accomplished of the two, and having a lot of success. So far, it's very difficult to tell the difference. Oh. Right, well, let's just see. Well, look at that. Jesus. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think the computer's gone on the blink. Maybe so there's a slight malfunction. Well, maybe there is. And it's called Men in White. <laughs> so there are Chris Bessie throwing more punches than we've seen in any other bout so far in these championships. And I've often said this, you know, Adrian, these judges get awfully confused. Um, so many punches landing at once, they can't press the button. It, the, the, the system is designed to fail. It's a completely flawed system and really should be got rid of. They should bring back judges who use their eyes and a piece of paper and if they are seen to be corrupt they should be got rid of forever they shouldn't have ruined, ruined the whole sport because of, of a few bent judges in, in Seoul absolutely 100% I totally agree with you with that I mean it's, it's impossible it's human nature to watch two people who actually involved in a competitive uh, spurt to actually score evenly for both of them yeah anyway here we go then for round three and let's see if there's a point on the board after this particular session it's um, bizarre at the moment and I'm, I'm sure each respective corner would have advised their boxer that uh, they're both, you know, on the level in par, so they'll be out there to do some uh, 
at least try to score. That's more important, in fact, than the point I made, that there not being any points on there at all. The point you just made, uh, you know, that Bessie looks by far and away superior, and yet he's boxing on level terms exactly. with Kevin Short. Exactly. It makes a mockery to a certain degree because, you know, we're sitting here watching two boxers who's thrown a tremendous amount of punches, a lot of work rate, but yet not one is scored. So you never can tell. Anyway, let's get back to the action then. Bessie up on the uh, balls of his feet, ready to either pounce forward or skip backwards. Short, flat-footed, much more of a professional style there from Shaw, wouldn't you say? Yes. He's maintaining his flow, though, uh, Short. He's right there in front of him. He's, I like the way he's moving his upper body, slipping the short punches. It's nice. And of course, Chris Bessie, I, uh, a protege of Mick Gannon's, the former Army coacher, uh, an old teammate of mine. And uh, he's actually done very well, Chris Bessie. Uh, he had a very good ground in his come on, and he's developed excellently. Bessie just landed a, a very good left hand there. But the problem for Bessie is a career, a career amateur, 27 years of age now. He'll be in the Army, I should imagine, for the full term. Um, Short's also 27, and then he'll probably be considering a, a professional career after these championships. Although, to be fair, it's difficult to box professionally as a serving soldier. Yes, it most certainly is. There's certain um, um, protocol to follow. There's only one I know of in the country at the moment, a serving soldier. And he's in the Worcester and Sherwood Foresters, and I wish I could remember his name. Anyway, <laughs> good round again there. Well, there you are. There's a point on the table now for Chris Bessie. After three rounds, it was uh, level after two, if you remember, at 1-0. Uh, sorry, at uh, nil-nil, zero, zero. I want to say. So, Kevin Short. At least Tough it's not, much, not that much for, uh, in it for Kevin Short. He still have opportunity to get himself back into the picture. Absolutely. For some points. Yeah, but the problem is, you know, with two rounds to go, it is conceivable that Short could land one or two punches and suddenly find himself winning. Yes, I also can find uh, Chris Bessie on the floor too. Absolutely. You just never know. So there's the Welsh coach, Stephen Lowe's. And, uh, both these boxers, 27 years of age. Short, very, very experienced. 210 bouts. Bessie's only had 80. Beside the coaches also, there is also the, the team supporters that they'll be in the crowd, you know, signaling the points, the leads, sure. and the scores. So round four then, this is the penultimate such session in this light middleweight preliminary. Bessie working hard with both hands, short there, trying to stick a bit closer, close down the gap and get his own work done. And of course, he would have known coming into this one that he didn't really have much of a chance about boxing Bessie. I'm sure they both evaluated each other's style and they probably figure out the strengths and the weaknesses. Although uh, uh, Short seems to be uh, concentrating on pulling back up his uh, shirt sleeve, so he obviously is very relaxed. Yes, you see, I think he's coming to here into this match saying, oh, nothing to lose, rotten draw, bad luck. Um, you know, might as well just go through it and get it, uh, get it over with and go home again. Go to the emotions. Of course, we're not trying to say that Kevin Short isn't trying. It's not a case of that. It's just a case of, you know, he, he knows what he was up against coming into this bout. Yes. And it's rotten bad luck that he should face a man as uh, as accomplished as Bessie, really, so early. And also, indirectly, his, his native teammate. Exactly, yeah. Well, but also, I noticed that it maybe it might be a possibility of a clash of styles, because they both have similar styles. And maybe that is a possibility, maybe a result of no scores. Very difficult to evaluate. Who's landing Let's not make shot. excuses for the system or the judges, Adrian. I mean, they, they are probably quite capable of making their own excuses. It's only for us to report uh, what we're seeing here. And at the moment, it's 1-0 to Chris Bessie coming into round four. Bessie, of course, in the red vest. Busy, nice work rate. And uh, this is the kind of form that will get Bessie in the medals, don't you think? Yes, I think so. He also seems to be taking control in this round, command in this round. He's using the jab effectively. He's using his, his left hand over the jab. Nice shot there by Kevin Short. Good left cross. Let's see what the score says. Well, still 1-0. So still a chance here that Short could win. Yeah. 
unbelievable. How do you feel about this at home? It's uh, quite bizarre, we think. Bit of replay. It's a bit of a competitive match, regardless of the fact that uh, Bessie is clearly the superior boxer of the two. Short's always been there, always given it his best, taken some good whacks. Yes. What is also a rarity is uh, nice to watch. To, well, it's not necessarily a, a nice to watch, but it's a nice rarity to watch two southpaws amateur with the head carries on this. And turning in a decent fight. Yeah. Because <laughs> at once, uh, one time, of course, southpaws were drowned at birth. <laughs> um, and rightly so, but... Uh, I guess so, I survived then. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, you know, southpaws, but they were converted as well, weren't they? You know, they tie, tied their right arm behind the back and changed their feet. Um, that, that used to happen an awful lot, of course, but uh, then suddenly southpaws became something of uh, a rarity and started getting results because orthodox boxers didn't know how to deal with them. Exactly. I mean, there seems to be as many southpaws as there does orthodox these days. Seems to be the end thing, huh? doesn't it? Uh -huh. So, fifth and final round then, Short needs that knockout. He's uh, only one point behind though, and if uh, you never can tell, you know, these judges might just pick for him. At least we know the machine isn't broken. Short sure, seems to come out with a, a much more serious intent this round. He obviously been told that uh, he's one point behind, so it's all or nothing on this round. Yep. And, you know, both men are clearly getting through with uh, punches that are jerking their head back. They're wearing 10-ounce gloves, by the way, in case you were wondering. Well, that time, Short got through with a nice left-right, uh, right-left, I should say. I'm, I'm admiring the way Chris is having his spurts of attack in and out, sort of combination, he's back out on his feet again. Would he have beaten you? Uh, I, I don't think so. <laughs> of course, you were ABA champion in 1990. Yes. I'm sure he probably was watching then. <laughs> yeah, he used to read about you when he was a kid. <laughs> of course, you're the same age, aren't you? 27? Yes. So, Steve, Chris Bassett, he seems to be uh, executing a, a very familiar uh, training pattern that uh, I recall that... Uh, Ian used to have us do, you know, in and out with those combinations and back out again. Yes, he's mastered it exceptionally well, hasn't he? Yes. Doesn't work for everybody, of course. No, it all complements the person individual style. But Bessie is fit enough to keep pumping out that right jab, followed by the left cross. No other great variety in this, uh, at this stage in the bout. Yes. You know, there's no hooks or uppercuts coming in from Bessie, but just doing enough, straight punching, when all else fails, pop out the jab, eh? Yeah. Winky Wright did that, didn't he? Oh, he did that to a T. <laughs> <laughs> so there we are then. 2-0 then to Chris Bessie at the end of a very spirited encounter against his mate Kevin Short. There you are. That's the, how the it's right, going to go down. The right victor, though. Oh, sure. No doubt about the, the winner. No doubt about, uh, you know, the superiority of Chris Bessie. But, uh, you know... Short effort, not at all reflected in that zero score. Just the way that Bessie's aggression wasn't. So well done, Chris Bessie. Two 0 the winner. Great sportsmanlike gestures. Absolutely, from, uh, Chris Short. Well, still to come tonight, we've got another bout. This time from the middleweight division, the 75 kilograms. We've got a man from Britain. By the name of Lowe against Papinus in 75 kilograms, Andrew Lowe, red corner, in action against a man by the name of Mantas Papinigis. I hope I said that right. Papinigis, by the way, from Lithuania, a triple Lithuanian champion, 94, 96, 97. 21 years of age, Papinigis. Andrew Lowe, 24. Gold medalist in the Commonwealth Federation Championships in South Africa a couple of years ago. And boxes for Repton. So Andrew Lowe has an opportunity here. Nice snappy jab there from Lowe. Just falling a centimetre short though. Very powerful legs Lowe. Very strong leg movements there. Yes, he's in good shape, isn't he Lowe? Very sharp punches, coming from low. Now 
Lo seems to be one of those very vocal boxers when they throw punches. A bit like yourself. Probably. I was very vocal when I got hit. <laughs> I screamed. <laughs> Beautiful sharp jab coming from the lows. Not, very I mean, they're not landing on the target with any great force, but uh, they look lovely, don't they, when they leave the, uh, they leave the, the, the chamber. And it's also food for the thought for the opponent as well, because with that jab constantly in his face, it, it stops him from trying to set. Absolutely right. Very positive start, this by Lowe. He seems to be very technically sound over his opponent. He's maintaining that form. And of course, if you're wondering, um, there are only 13 weight divisions in amateur boxing, from light fly up to super heavyweight. They don't have things like super feather and super middle um, in, in amateur boxing or cruiserweight. In fact, they do now. They've just actually had cruiserweight put back in. But um, there are several major differences in the weight categories. Well, you've got to give that round to Andrew Lowe. He, did all the, he was the man leading off, wasn't he? I wonder how many points are on the yes. table here. It'll be very interesting to see the scores now. Yes, it will. Well, that's interesting. Well, I think that's a fair reflection of the, of the first round. Andrew Lowe, one up. After two minutes. Showing a replay here. He seems to be very focused, very keen. He's listening to sound advice from uh, Ian. Relaxed. What are the essentials for these major tournaments? Staying relaxed, listening to... Uh, good uh, sound advice. Yes, he looks a, a pretty attractive proposition at the moment, Andrew Lowe. 24 years of age, Repton member, which of course, a Repton member getting to this stage, he's got to be a good fighter. He most certainly do. He seems to be extremely in well and good condition, which is very nice. Mm. Trained, of course, by Tony Burns at the Repton Club. I was with Tony the other night at a show in Chigwell. Mr. Burns. Mr. Burns. So round two then of the scheduled five. Should they have kept it at three threes? I think so. I think so. It should have kept it at three threes. It gives uh, it's opened the platform for a more better competition. This round, uh, Papaniki seems to be uh, stepping up, increasing the pace. He's using his jab much more often. But that time he walked straight into low. Straight into that ramrod left hand of Andrew Lowe. And of course at one time, Adrian, you know as well as I do, you know better than I do in fact. You know, being a successful amateur meant you'd be a successful pro. Uh, and it was a natural theme of progression. Yeah. Um, resented, of course, mightily by the ABA and uh, all of their cohorts. But, uh, you know, that is a fact. You know, I mean, it, was, it always was a, a reality, wasn't it? Yes, it's a natural progression, but now it's not necessarily not the same. Although I'm going back to the contest, Papanega seems to be catching um, low with some very clean headshots. He's increased the pace. And you heard Ian Irwin say a right uppercut would be a good shot to throw. And he's done that one. That's a slightly low blow there, I thought, from uh, low. I'm just wondering, there looks to be a speck of blood on the uh, the shorts now of Papinigis in this second round. Maybe a possible nosebleed. Probably got caught with a clean punch in the nose or something. Oh, nice, powerful round this for Papinigis. I don't think he's winning it, but uh, certainly an awful lot uh, more effective for him than in round one. Well, what are they going to say here? This will be interesting. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, 3 1 up now. Andre Lowe, 3 1 up. I After think the scores score reflect, it's a reflection of what we're looking at. Uh, Lowe seems to be, he's very technically sound, uh, seems to have good at boxing ability. He almost looks like a pro. Good, nice, high guards. Oh, took a good left hook there, though, from Papanigas. Landed in the gloves, more like it. And uh, 
I like it. I like his movement. He has a very, uh, very loose style. Just reminded then, Andrew Lowe, 24 years of age, 46 wins in 58 contests. Good form. Gold medalist in the Commonwealth Federation Championships in South Africa in 1996. And he's up against the 21-year-old Lithuanian, Mantas Papinigis, the winner of 151 of his 182 bouts, and three times a Lithuanian champion as we come out for round three. So can Andrew Lowe keep it up? And there is blood on the shorts of Papanigis. That's a lovely left hook then from Lowe. Good punch, well timed. He's countering very beautiful. He's catching uh, Papanigas on the way in as he comes in. With those counter shots. Very nice, elusive movements. And good defensively as well, I would have thought, Lowe. Yes. Um, lots of these charges show from, from the Lithu Lithuanian have gone whizzing harmlessly by. Just a little deft turn of the shoulders or shift of the feet. That was a lovely combination thrown by Lowe there. One two to the body, one to the head, left hook to the head. Seems to be well schooled, uh, Lowe. Well, coming from Repton, you have to be well schooled. Absolutely. To show it, Tony Brennan will make sure to that. Nice variety I'm looking at here in this competition, especially in this particular bout. Lowe did take a particularly good right hand from Papanigas a moment ago. Even when he's not throwing low, he seems to have his defense well tucked up, most of the punches landing on his arms. Not much left now in this uh, third round of a scheduled five. And once again, it's been a good round, I think, for Lowe, although... We're seeing a much better effort again from Papanigas. I doubt very much that's the way that uh, they pronounce it in Lithuania, but I'm afraid that's the best we can do. Oh, good shot there, catching low. A very competitive round this round. Both boxes landing with clean punches. Oh, once again, the right hand from Papanigas got through. Well, that's a good round. I wonder where they've gone. Four, four, three. That's very close now. Where does Le Mans 24 Hours take place? England? From Repton, one of three Repton boxers. The other two being, by the way, Audley Harrison and Courtney Fry. And it also must be said that low boxing exceptionally well here, considering he's a replacement for John Pierce, who had to withdraw due to injury. He's making the most of his opportunity, it appears. Uh, he's doing pretty well at the moment. What is appears to be a very, very good competitive fight. And he's only one point in front, of course, with two rounds left. This one and one more. It was, uh, he was 3-1 up after two and 4-3 up after three. Good comeback then by Papanigas. He stopped using his jab the way he was using effective in the first round. And maybe he should maybe try to get back, get back to that uh, using that effective jab of his. Yes, Help. that's a good point. Behind the jab, it was a different fight, wasn't it? Yes, he was catching uh, Papanigas under uh, the attack. Papanigas, on the other hand, he seems to be uh, increasing the tempo. He's, uh, he's using his jab more effectively now. Yeah, that was a good shot there from Papanigas with the jab. And I suppose at this stage it comes down to who wants it more. Uh, most certainly. I mean, the lungs are burning. And uh, obviously with the added anxiety towards knowing the scores. But should the lungs be burning after three rounds, Adrian? Well... It may not be necessarily physical, it's in the nervous energy. Psychological, you know. A lot of anxiety, it, it causes a lot of uh, tension. This is the second quarter now for low or low head movements. They tend to be very stringent with that they rule. They do indeed, yes. And he can ill afford to lose a point at this stage. Happening is he's doing the majority of the work now in this particular round. 
In fact, the public warning will cost you two points now. It used to be three. Well, what's the score now, I wonder? Who's going to be in front, Adrian? Oh, oh thank goodness. 5-3 now. Ooh, Andrew Lowe. Well, he is landing the cleaner, more effective punches. I must say that for Lowe. So there's the Lithuanian coach. That's uh, Julius Kibas. And uh, he's trying to get some... Oh, well, trying to get something out. Not trying to get something here, but trying to get something out. It needs a... A fight-winning performance in this final round from Papanigas in this middleweight prelim. I see a lot more potential in uh, Lowe. He, you know, sometimes, especially fighting uh, boxers from Lithuania, they tend to be on the awkward side. And, you know, uh, I'm, he may be uh, caught up in, uh, in, a, in a couple of phases there trying to figure out uh, what uh, Papanigas' next move may be there. And this is not going to be a comfortable round for Andy Lowe. He's got two minutes, probably the roughest two minutes of his life. And he hasn't got that significant of a lead, so no. he has to maintain that control, keep keep control of the bout, try to use that jab more effectively that he was using in the first round. He's a successful fighter, though, Lo. You know, not only did he win that Commonwealth Federation Championship, but also got a gold at the Tama tournament. Um, so, you know, he's, he's no fool. He's, uh, he's been around on the international circuit. He knows what's required. And he knows what to expect, too, how to sure. use this, this computer scoring system. But I think you're right. That jab needs to be the dominant weapon here. He's allowed that to slip now to Papanigas. Oh, that's a crunching right by Pap Papanigas. Oh. And yes, Lowe's in trouble. That was a good punch. That caught with a second hand. And very smart of Lowe. He stayed there and crowded the, uh, the Lithuanian Papanigas. Nullify his uh, aggression. But isn't it interesting how Papanigas is doing exactly what he needs to do for a man who's two points behind with one round to go. He needs to come and force the pace, force the fight. And that's exactly what he's doing. It all comes down to who wants it the most, as you said earlier on. Nice Great left hook. left hook there. Again, he just stopped using the jab completely. No, that is. Yes, it's, a, it's more of a punch-up now in the boxing match from yeah. Lowe's point of view. And he's getting vulnerable now to that uh, right cross of Papanigas, he needs to get that jab working once again. Referee's just told Lowe he's had his third and final warning before he doles out the public warning, which will cost him an ill-afforded two points. Oh, good punch. Beautiful. That's the kind of shot he needs. A couple more of that than the tall run. Of course, knockdowns don't count for extra points in this sport anymore. But that's a pity. Much, much more increase in pace from the Papanigas from Lithuania. He obviously really wants this. Hey, there's not going to be much in it at the finish, is there? It's nail-biting now. Yeah. A lot of years have gone into that preparation, so it's not so easy to let it go like that, you know? And, of course, this is, uh, I suppose, um, as far as the draw's concerned, the easiest match. Um, well, it's not, is it? Because, I mean, uh, Papanigas could well have been a, a, a final opponent, but... Uh, the fact is, it's going to get harder from here on in, isn't it? Oh, uh, most definitely will. Seconds to go, then, in this final round. And there's the belt. So, who for you? I think uh, best is done. I mean, Lowe has done enough to win it. Oh, goodness. 7-5. There you are. So, Andy Lowe wins 7-5 after five hectic rounds against a very good, um, improving Mantas Papanikas, who came on a bomb, didn't he, after three? Most definitely. And this would have been good for her uh, Lowe as well. Having a contest like this, it'll give him a, a mental edge now. Yeah, he's won a tough fight. So, excellent word on Andy Lowe. Potential medalist. Still to come then, we have another match on the middleweight division. We've got a man called Jean-Paul Mendy of France in the red corner in action here against Ivan Rybak of Yugoslavia. Interesting contest, this one, of course, we're just to remind you that Andy Lowe went through in this division and could well be facing the winner of this particular contest. Yes, yeah, also one of the uh, better contests where the name ever easily pronounced. <laughs> Absolutely. So, Jean-Paul Mendy, there he is. 34 years of age, a veteran at 34. Of course, at 35, you've got to pack it in these days. Yes, as they, amateurs. They've actually extended it. It used to be 30 before, I think. I believe in 88, it used to be 30, now it's yeah. 34. And I remember the oldest ever amateur boxer by record, um, in fact, in recent years, not ever, in recent years, my old mate Jackie Wiley. 
Wow, how and, old was he? Uh, he? I think he was 41 when he stopped boxing. Wow. Which is pretty, you know, pretty old, isn't it? But he always looked 60 anyway, even yeah. when he was 30. Sorry, Jackie. Ivan Ribeck seems to be a, a, a very uh, eccentric dresser here. His boots looks like Ooh, it's yeah. unlaced. I'm quite surprised. They're very stringent in the amateur rule. They would have probably asked him to uh, sure. lace that up. Yes, absolutely. They're very unusual to see anyone with a little bit of uh, finesse or personal traits in, a, in an amateur boxing ring. It's all very, very same, isn't it? And they both look like two very strong punches here. Southpaw versus North of that. Yep, Mendy, the Southpaw, leading with the right. And uh, 72 wins, by the way, for Mendy. And 80 contests. That's good form. Th five times the French national champion. And Ivan Reback, well, he's won 89 of his 96, so an even better statistical record. I don't know too much about Reback, I'm afraid. He's 24 years of age, 10 years younger than Mendy. Will that make a difference? Ah, oh, not really, when the bell rings. One punch will make a difference in everything. But based on what I'm looking at so far, I think uh, Lowe has a good chance here with either one of these two guys. Yeah. He has good lateral movement. He has a variety of punches. But we're seeing, uh, once again, a, a fairly timid start, though, aren't we? So, yes. you know, there's more to come from these two lads. Again, styles make fights. You know, I think uh, what I'm seeing here, Lowe had a, maybe a, a much more tougher uh, opponent, more awkward than uh, maybe Mendy has in front of him. Yeah, now. sure. Would Mendy be your pick for this one? Uh, as you said, they just started, so you never know. I mean, uh, changes rhythm, changes tempo. Right, let's see what the judges think. Well, they've got Mendy one point in front after one round, and that's probably about right, wouldn't you say? Yes, I think. So there he is then, Jean-Paul Mendy. Do you Fair. think he's related to uh, Jean-Baptiste Mendy or Christophe Mendy or any of the other Mendys that have come out of France? Uh, I really don't know. It's, uh, it's a very popular very... name. Yeah. So uh, I, I believe it's uh, a Gambian name. Uh, they, they have several tribes there, Wolof, as well as the Mandinka tribes. So it could be one of either one of those names. Thank you for that. So touch of replay from round one. And we wait on the start of round two. And uh, Dominic Nato there, the trainer of Mendy, very successful in Paris, isn't he? He is. One of the consistent coaches that they have on the, uh, the national squad train quite a few of the national champions. In fact, I mean, Paris, really, when you think about it, the French are going through the best period of their lives um, as a team, um, doing well on the international stage, had seven qualifiers for Atlanta, which was a record. So anyway, back to the action here, round two of the scheduled five, and uh, we've got uh, Jean-Paul Mendy in the red vest, the Frenchman, against this man from Yugoslavia. Shouldn't it be the former Yugoslavia? Shouldn't it be? Uh, he's actually from the uh, the city of Belgrade. Now, I'm afraid I'm not too up on my. Oh, there, there's uh, there's several breakup states. You have Macedonia, Serbia, Croatia, several other breakup Slovakia, states. But, but they're still the mainland. Czech Republic, uh, Yugoslavia, yes. And and but they're still the, there's a part that is called Yugoslavia. Okay. Uh, one of their um, lands. But uh, so far, uh, it looks like Mendy's on top. Regardless of where. Uh, Reback comes from. Yeah. Well, we might not know where he comes from, but we know where he's going, don't we? Yes. He seems to be lacking ideas on the offense, and also seems like an ideas on the defense. It looks so far he's in a no-win situation. Yes, he's. Uh, he just hasn't got the pace, I don't think, that's required to deal with Mendy. He looks pretty one-dimensional. He's got a problem. His head guard, I believe, came loose there. They are a major headache, aren't they? Yeah. To give the pun. They're meant to be protecting, but they, you know, they have a ten, especially the one he's wearing, the particular head guard he's wearing, the top ten. They tend to cause a severe deep cut sometimes, the lining on the inside. Yes, I've heard that. Sharp. On occasion. Good rally there from Mendy. Yes. So the big question is, what on earth can Reback do here to counter Mendy? He's getting beaten all ends up at the moment. Um, but more importantly, 
Um, his prospects look bleak, don't they? Yes, yes, most certainly. He also looked like he's having uh, great difficulties trying to adjust to Mendy's southpaw style. He doesn't seem to be able to figure out uh, how to get on the inside. Mm. And even with 90, 96 bouts under his belt, he still looks a bit raw, doesn't he? He looks very, very, very raw. So, how have they gone? With two gone, three nil, that's about right. Um, you know, it's a reflection of who's winning the contest, not yes. exactly by how much. Yes, but it's a true reflection of who's on, who's on the top at the moment. Mendy seems to be in control now, obviously that goes with his experience and his age. Very yeah. calm. I think he's the senior of this uh, European Championships. Yes. Well, so, you know, that word fair in boxing is, is overcome by maturity too. You know, and a guy who's mature as, as uh, Mendy is, he... he uh, he obviously is on top of the, on the game at the moment as far as uh, the opponents in front of him. Looks very powerful, those uh, forearms of his. Yes, round three coming up then. Here we are then, round three. Jean-Paul Mendy in the red corner from France in action against Ivan Rybak from Yugoslavia. And at the moment, Mendy's done everything right. Rybak's one chance here, and he knows it, is to land that right hand. He does fancy himself as a right-hand puncher, doesn't yes. he? Yes. Although I find it there. quite surprising. Mendy came on this round totally uh, boxing. Hmm. And they both are thinking quite as, you know, they're trying to figure out each one's lead. And sometimes that can be, uh, that can go against. Because yeah, sure. you tend to think too much. And once again, it must be, we must remind you that they, they don't want to do too much here in these early uh, stages of the competition, but they still need to do enough to win it, to find balance. Great right hand there by uh, Mendy. Oh, good shot. Lovely left cross there, just catching Reback on the chin. Again, uh, Reback seems to be he, having difficulty getting on the inside. He's l reaching with his punches, he's losing his balance. He's out of step, out of range. And he seems to, every mistake he makes, get a counter with that. Yep, he gets punished, doesn't he? Yes. <laughs> and he's not having the best of times, then. Ivan Reback. Doesn't look that happy. Not that you're supposed to be happy during the ring anyway. Well, you, you are, aren't you? It's yeah. fun boxing. It is fun boxing, you know, it's controlling the emotions. I guess a better word would be focus. Yeah. I'm becoming very scrappy at this part of the round. Yes, I think principally because Rebac realised he's not going to win this one. He wants to survive, but Mendy's realised that he knows he can't win it, uh, and, and he's trying to put the cap on it by, by taking him out of there. Yes. And, th and that's what's happening. Now Rebac is on survival mode. And that's as clear as the nose on my face. And uh, very demoralised Rebac, isn't he, coming back yes. to the corner? Mm, yeah, it reflects in the scoring as well. Yeah. He's actually having that, no, uh, that one punch landed, scored. <laughs> So there's the French trainer and we're going to sit through a bit of replay here then from round three. Mendy there forcing the issue, forcing Reback backwards. So two rounds to go then. Referee there just having a word with Mendy. Keep your head up, says he. I'm oh, sorry, but with Reback, I'm, I'm sorry. So, Ivan Reback looking to get a point on the table. And everything to do. Can he do it? He just never can tell. As I said yesterday, one moment you're top seed and the next you're fertilizer. <laughs> Absolutely. Good line. Good right hand from 
We back. Well, if the boots was meant to be giving him some sort of an incentive, sure is not doing that. Well, doesn't necessarily mean just because you turn out looking great, you're going to fight that way. But it don't, let's not forget, I mean, he's, out, he's up against a seasoned fighter here in Mendy, isn't he? Yes, he is, but he seems to be having extreme difficulty with the southpaw stance yeah. of Mendy. He doesn't know how to, he doesn't seem to know how to actually get on the inside. Yes, I'll go along with that. Mendy, on the other hand, I mean, maybe I'm being a little bit too stern, but uh, if, if you get the, the impression that if he puts a couple of punches together, he can possibly, you know, force a stoppage. But since this is also the middleweight division where Andy Lowe went through from Repton, um, how do you think Lowe would fare here? I think Lowe has a, a great prospect against Mendy because his boxing is all about styles. And they're both, they seem to be both boxers who like to pick their punches. And based on what I saw in Lowe in the, in, in the last contest, he, he, um, he's got the ability to, to beat, defeat Mendy, in my opinion, that is. Oh, that's a lovely punch there from Mendy, right hook. Solid shot. As you recall, when they started out, Mendy seemed to be very tentative. And he, obviously, he realized he's in total control. He's in, he's a mile ahead, miles ahead of um, uh, Bebek, is it? Yep, Ivan Rebek from Yugoslavia in the blue vest. He's uh, getting a bit of a shelling here. Mendy boxing very well, in fact. And Rebek looks a very frustrated fighter. Boxer, that is. He does, doesn't he? Look, 8 1 now the two, to, to Jean Paul Mendy. But it's nice to see that Reback's actually got a point on the board, don't you think? Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, the worst thing, how did they do in the European Championships, Dad? I, got I didn't get a single point. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, that's awful, isn't it? Well, he always had that had excuse of saying, well, it's the computer. Yeah, now. but, you know. That's a lovely right hook from Mendy. Good punch. Well, I'm just trying to think how many qualifiers there were from Yugoslavia. There were, in fact, only one. And to believe it or not, this is it. So this looks to end their interest, surely. And barring, of course, a knockout, this looks to end the Yugoslavian interest in the European Championship for 1998. They will have to try again. Well, let's see what he has to offer this round. Pity. But it's, it's ironic, you know, you'd have thought that the Yugoslavians would have had far more qualifiers through. Yes. I guess they're going to a, um, you know, a different stage now, with the breakers for the stage. Yeah, sure, sure. Having to regroup and get themselves yeah. back on the international uh, platform. And there's only 191 boxers in this year's tournament. Um, the cut down from he 304 got, boxes. He actually got caught there. Uh huh. By the rapper, you ruled that a slip. So much more manageable European Championship this year. Reback, he, he seems to be just following Mendy around the ring. You would have thought that maybe, okay, it's the last round, he'll try to put everything into it. But, uh, yes, but I, I think, as you said, um, Adrian, he's just not coping with the Southpaw style of Mendy. Yeah at all well um, he's got no left hook to talk of and that's exactly what he needs yeah he needs a left hook and that's another <laughs> untidy mess there from Ivan Reback. those are signs of frustration you know walking straight onto Mendy's powerful left hand you know doing absolutely yes. everything wrong really isn't he yes and don't you hate it when they make fundamental errors oh, well you've got to wonder how they've been schooled you know, it sometimes depends on the opponent in front of you, too. You have some guys who you yeah, don't but, have to stop. But Mendy's not forcing Reback to go to his own right. I know he's not. You know, <laughs> but this from Reback's, you know, probably is from his view, it's like, I can't touch this guy. I can't yeah. even get on the inside, and I can't even get on the outside. Whatever I try to do seems to fail. That's a fact, yes. But he's not helping his cause by being, I, I think, poorly schooled in uh, the art of fighting a southpaw, but they are. That's my opinion. But you'd have thought at this level, come on. It's yeah. a European Championship. It's the third biggest amateur tournament in the world. You do get the odd bunch that comes through and you wonder how the hell did they get there, but you just never know. 
Yes, we don't know what the qualification. Yeah, we don't know the qualification process was like in Yugoslavia. As you said, you know the country's in disarray really, as far as uh, sport is concerned, yeah. and that's a very demoralised Ivan Rebak. Won't be helped, of course, by our comments when he gets home later. Well, and he looks very it. frustrated, very <laughs> dejected. What was the score there? Nine one. Nine one. Well, he can at least say he competed, and he lost to a, a better boxer. Which is more than we did. Yes. I've never actually competed in the European Championships. So here we go then for the official score. Jean-Paul Mendy then goes forward and uh, well he's got a, he's got a, uh, you know, he could easily face Andy Lowe, you never know. Oh, Still to come tonight then, we've got Craster. They are in the blue corner, we have a man by the name of Torsten Bergeson. Oh, sorry, my apologies, Bengison of Germany. In action here against Emil Kreistev. Of Bulgaria. So the Bulgarian in the red, and of course Bulgaria and Germany, great tradition of success in amateur boxing. Germany, by the way, got ten qualifiers through here, and the German, as you can see, the South Paw, in those very common, um, rather, rather than popular, common black and white striped trunks. Yes, it's a, a very popular Adidas uh, boxing trunk. And... Uh, Christev, one of five qualifiers for Bulgaria. They both seem, appear to be a very uh, experienced uh, boxers that using the computer here. Yep. Style. And Emil Christev, the Bulgarian in the red, well, he's had 88 victories in 96 outings. That's very good. He's the reigning Bulgarian champion. And this German, Torsten Bengerson, well, He's won 142 of his 190 bouts. He's 25 years of age now, and but he was a former world junior champion, and he was uh, a bronze medalist in the world team championship. So uh, you know he's got some decent form, very decent form. Christ have only 21. Bengtsson, on the other hand, he's demonstrating that, that typical art from the German team, which they're they're always coached to have very high, very tucked in defenses and. You know, when their, their, their opponents throw punches, that they just curl into that little defense up there. Exactly. They're all cast on the same mold, aren't they? Yes. Because also, it's, it's actually very effective for the scoring system, because when the judges do see that, they realize the punch is not landing cleaning, so they do not score. So far, a very, uh, a very uh, tentative opening round. Both boxers seem to be feeling each other out. Well, it's interesting, isn't it, that Christeff there has has the longer arms, yeah. has the weapons, is feinting them, yeah. but simply not letting them go. Possibly for the very, very reason you just stated that it's difficult to actually prize them open, isn't it? Yes. And of course, Germany have had an awful lot of success on the amateur and professional stage oh. of late and once again nothing scored there in fact you I know, think it actually reflected the true uh, I think you're right you know boxing ability very little around. scoring yes. done there by either man and once again remind you that all of these bouts are scheduled for five two minute rounds that's a change of course from the previous three three minute rounds I often wonder with a few exceptions why is it predominantly a lot of Taller boxers tend to crouch down to the height of the, their, their opponent. That's a very good question. Would all tall boxers please respond by postcard only? Why do you do that? <laughs> There's been a few exceptions, I must say. Not many, though. Tommy Hearns being one of yes. them. He's extremely tall. So here we go then for round two. Just to remind you, the Bulgarian, by the name of Emil Kreistev, in the red, in action here against the German Torsten Bengerson. 
lives in Schwerin in Germany, wherever that may be. And uh, Christhead comes from a place called Plovdiv, which is probably not the way you say it. That's always a nightmare, you know, when you're doing these international events, you know, as, as I have done over the last few years. You get so many strange names and it gets, it gets, it gets very difficult. So you make them up in the end. <laughs> you end up uh, just satisfying your own pronunciation. Absolutely. And I do apologize to anyone around Europe here, to all of those who are criticizing us for actually getting these names wrong, but what choice have we got? I suppose we could have asked how to say it. That would have made sense, wouldn't it? Yeah, possibly. Anyway, back to the action here. Um, this German knows how to close the gap. You see the way that jab got through there? Just moved his feet very, very quickly. Yes, and he's moving very neatly behind that uh, shell over defense, turtle shell over defense. Nice little left hook, though, from Christeff. Needs a few more of those. Christeff now got a breathing nose. Again, these two boxers from both very powerful nations of amateur boxing, you know, they, they know exactly how to utilize the scoring system. As you can see, they're not doing that much. They're both looking for that opening for the clean shot. That will catch the judge's eyes. That court for using the back end there. Mm -hmm. Good kind of left hook from uh, Bengtson. Bengtson. So then, then around two, what will the score will be now? It was 0-0, zero, zero, it's 1-1. One, one. Well, that's interesting. Um, is that a fair reflection, Adrian? I feel so. I think that, um, you know, they're both not doing that much. Yeah. You know, obviously them having an awareness of probably uh, each other's style. They probably evaluated, evaluated each other from the previous contest. Would you have liked to have fought in a European Championship? I would have loved to. As a matter of fact, I, I wanted so badly, I actually, you know, book a flight myself and went and watched the uh, 1991 EM Championships in Gothenburg, where I actually took my video camera to tape everybody who I thought it was a possible opponent. But you also took, booked your own flight, went to Atlanta. I remember you sitting in with us yeah. in Atlanta. You just can't keep away, can you? Well, I'm addicted, you know. I'm a student of the game. I like, I love boxing. Rather love boxing. than afflicted. <laughs> you can call it being obsessed. Mm -hmm. Hey. So round three then. And uh, this big man, this tall Emil Kreistev from Bulgaria, um, you know, this fight looks like it's one he could win. Um, but will he? You never know. The dice can change. I He's mean, got the physical attributes to do it, hasn't he? Bengtsson seems to be getting more progressively aggressive now. I mean, he, uh, I noticed in the last round, he, he was one step closer towards um, Kreistev. That's nice. No great power behind those shots from Christeff, but uh, trying to prize this German open. Has immense reach. Christeff, just not using it. Yeah, and he should be really be yes. grabbing the center of the ring, yes. shouldn't he, and forcing yes. um, Bengison on the outside there. Seems to be having difficulty with his head guard. He keeps fumbling with it. I'm not surprised. They're awful. I don't care who makes them. They're just awful. The whole, the whole concept of head guards is just terrible. Anyway, enough of that. And although Christ has had 96 amateur contests, You'd have thought he'd have known how to deal with someone like this, wouldn't you? Yes, I expect a little bit more from him. I mean, he, he seems to be, he doesn't seem to be a very comfortable fighter no. against this uh, Bengtsson. Could it be, Adrian, that, you know, he's suffering the dilemma of so many, quali uh, you know, uh, men in the prelim rounds that they don't want to do too much and yet they need to do enough? That's a possibility. Or, or, or can he just not handle it? I think maybe it's also to do with that, uh, that that, that uh, turtle eye defense of uh, Bengtsson, you know, sometimes it, it can be a, a real put off. You know that no matter what you do, it's coming up against, uh, you know, elbows and heads. Mm. I mean, it's a very, very well constructed defense. 
Well, an interesting round there. Um, well, in fact, Bengison, in fact, gets the nod there. Two one up now to Bengison. Again, I mean, the scoring reflects that uh, that very tight defense of Bengison because, I mean, the judges obviously can see that it's very tight defense and there's no jarring punch that you can visibly see his head going back. And it's the kind of fight that Christev's going to watch on video tomorrow and think, I could have won that. Right. I mean, having said that, it's not over yet no. for him, but still, I mean, if he should lose this, I mean, he'll be biting his teeth again. But we normally expect great success from the Germans. And uh, as, of course, they've had great success over the years. I'm sure you would have had some advice from Coach uh, Ramin, is it? You pronounce that Ramin from Germany? Um, that's a, yeah, Otto Ramin, yes. He's very well experienced. So this then is round four, 2-1 to the German Bengison after three. Not that much in it. Nope. I mean, still open for you, the boxer. Good right hand from uh, Bengison. And he boxed, of course, for Guyana in the 1988 Olympics in Seoul. You must have been their only representative, surely. I was one of three three boxers on that team. Really? It was a junior middleweight, and there was a, a, a flyweight. How did they get on? Uh, they both lost their first contest. And you? I got to the third round. I lost to, um, well, I was robbed, I should say, to Rainy Geese of Germany. At the <laughs> time, it was West Germany. And we've three, never forgiven him since away. <laughs> three, two, and I haven't forgotten either. It still cuts like a knife. Whichever way. I'm sure uh, Vegas and Gressif, they both have opportunity if they so choose to uh, be Olympians and be gold medalists, to fulfill in their own and personal ambitions. Now we'll always be on the guy on the other side, just standing there dreaming of seeing myself on that podium <laughs> with a gold medal around my neck. I guess that's why I'm really considering uh, one man's calling. <laughs> Every way, uh, Crash Dev, he, he's... Uh, He's not doing anything particular now. I mean, he just seems to be standing on the outside waiting for... Uh, I'll tell you what it was. There was one part of the equation I didn't mention. I just don't think Christ is good enough. Well, based on his record and, you know... He sounds like he should be, doesn't he? Yeah. yeah. He but just isn't. He's just not doing much. On the night, he hasn't done it. And that's four gone. Now 3-1 up to Torsten Bengesen of Germany. And, um, you know, as a, you know the, the, we do, boxers do have off nights, don't they? Yes. I don't know, maybe the possibility of Kreshtev, I mean, uh, Kreshtev, it, it might be his uh, weight trained. He seems to be extremely tired after the third round. Uh, I notice in the corner there he's bending over. He may possibly have some sort of an injury that he's, uh, you know, he's been carrying. You just never know. I mean, this competition, it's very intense. The competition, I mean, it's easy for us sitting down there, but actually there, you know, there's not much uh, bandages that you can use. So sometimes there's, you know, hand injury. There's, uh, you know, it could be some stomach virus that he might be carrying that can uh, lull his performance. You just never know. Whichever way, under night, uh, if you can't, then you shouldn't be in there. Right, two minutes to go then to decide the winner here. Don't forget, this is still within Christev's reach. He's only two points behind at 3-1 to Bengison. Although, to be honest, it's... It, you know, they're not scoring two points a round, are they? Um, so it's it's probably impossible. Although that's a big word that to use. It's pr very unlikely um, that, uh, that Emil Krastev will actually claw back those two points. And even if he does, the count back, which will be an operation in the event of a level bout after five rounds, the count back would surely show that he wasn't actually the winner. But they are. I'm de I dare say we will see a bit of that as the <laughs> week goes by. Possibility always exists. And don't forget, of course, we're going to bring you coverage every night of these uh, European Senior Championships from Minsk. And uh, we hope you join us every night.
again, he seems to be a little bit more aggressive this round, Fresh Jeff. But landing cleanly and catching the judge's eye is a different story. I mean, he has that uh, a very hard defense of Angusson to penetrate. Are we looking at a potential gold medalist here in the shape of Angusson? Well, any potential opponent would have to figure out a way of getting past that defense. Yes, mm. it's uh, pretty smart, isn't it? Very yes. Marcus Bayer ish Yes, and very, and very computer friendly. Yeah. Thirty seconds to go then in this fifth and final round. And once again, we're seeing a German who knows the system. Can't fault a crash effort for, um, you know, effort in this round. He's really trying. He's making all the moves. I guess uh, Bengison realizes he's ahead now, so, you know, he just use what he has best. His defense and his lateral movement. Kostev, one of five Bulgarian qualifiers, and the, the bell is end. Well, it's 5-1 now, undoubtedly superior. Torsten Bengis and they're 5-1 the winner. He goes through to the quarterfinals now. The last eight. Bengis, I must say, he has a, a, a perfectly suited style towards the computer. Very tight defenses. And whenever he does go on the offense, it's, it's very uh, sporadic, but it's very effective. But it's a risk-free kind of attitude, isn't it? Don't you think? Most certainly a very risk-free attitude. Which almost brings us to the end of our program this evening as Bengison gets the nod but we as I said we've got bags of action for you from the European Championships still to come and tomorrow we'll be featuring bouts from the fly light flyweight division hope you enjoyed it yes tomorrow night then more coverage from the quarterfinal stages of the European Championships here on Eurosport thank you for the European Senior Boxing Championships from Minsk in Belarus we're going to kick off the light flyweight contest 48 kilograms, this one. In the red corner, we have the Frenchman. His name is Jerome Thomas. Well, that's Oleg Kiryukin of the Ukraine in the blue corner. 23 years of age. Good little boxer, this lad. Bronze medal in the Junior Olympic Games in Atlanta. Silver medal in the European Championships this event two years ago when they were held in Denmark. And with me again, I'm delighted to say, Adrian Dodson. Adrian, how do you see this one going? Well, they both seem to be very young uh, amateur boxers, uh, have good experience behind them. Uh, obviously, it's in the last 16 now, so uh, everybody will be pretty much familiar who they have ahead of them and uh, what kind of style they have and what their opposition will be presented in, ahead of them. So Jerome Thomas then, eager to get on with this one. He's only 19 years of age. Runner-up in the World Junior Championships. 44 wins, by the way, for Thomas out of 50 contests. And, uh, well, it must be said that Oleg Kiryukin um, is obviously a very experienced boxer, although we don't have his entire record. So here we go, there's a round one of the scheduled five twos. It seems a very nice boxing, aren't we, Adrian? So far we have. Uh, I mean, obviously it's coming down to the last 16 now, so we'll be seeing a lot more intense competition, a lot more style, and, and the better boxers coming through this round. Yes, it must be said that every boxer had to qualify. Quite a stiff qualification to be here in the last uh, 32. And now, as Adrian remarked, down to the last 16, the quarterfinal stage, any chaff there may have been will have been sorted well and truly by this point and all the quality matches still to come of course oh, nice long straight punches there from Kiryukin yes he seems to be very uh, you know, very uh, relaxed in what he's doing he seems to have a precise uh, you know mode of throwing his punches Kiryukin in the blue from the Ukraine nice style this reminds me a bit of Istvan Kovacs a man who uh, should have at least twice, in my, in my opinion, been given the best boxer award at uh, two Olympic Games, but didn't get it. It's a very classy boxer, is Turn pro now, of course. 
Actually, that's quite a compliment being compared to Kovacs, isn't it? Yes, it is. I mean, uh, Kovac, he was very stylish, and a very uh, experienced boxer, very classy. Thomas, he's very, he's holding his ground. He's not, uh, doesn't seem to be intimidated by uh, the Ukraine. Early days, of course, here. Time, of course, for Jerome Thomas to make his mark. We've seen um, quite a few slow starts, haven't we? And it's kind of built up as the rounds have built on. And yes, the momentum keeps going more intensely as the rounds go on. But as now, he's, as you can see, the, uh, it's going down to the last 16 now. So from the onset, everyone is throwing their combinations and getting Absolutely. their punches off. Good start, then. Well, you know, not surprising. We had this last night, um, you know, after some pretty decent exchanges, no points on the board. We're not going to make too much of a fuss of that. But uh, for my money, Oleg Kiryukin won the first round pretty comfortably. I would agree with that. Uh, he seems to be the more, uh, you know, dominant boxer in that round. Once more, a bit of replay here from round one. And that's that long right hand from Kiryukin. Nice boxer. And it looks like Jerome Tomas is going to have to get his uh, finger out here and do a lot of work. I'm very impressed with uh, Tomas from France. His, his uh, composure for someone who's so young and in such a, a big competition as the European Championship. Round two then. Nil nil. All to play for. And although we have criticised the nil-nil scores, um, even after three completed rounds, um, one thing we can say is that you rarely do see a bad decision. You might get one per tournament, one that really sticks out anyway. Um, you know, it's so, by and large, I suppose the machine is fair in that respect. see in the second round here is um, the Ukraine is uh, stepping up the pace. He seems to be uh, trying to add a little bit more aggression towards uh, Thomas. No really clean punches has actually land so far. No doubt that Oleg Kiryukin is the classier of the two. More experienced, of course, at a higher level. Although, as I did say, we don't have his full record to hand. 23 years of age, four years more mature, of course, and Tom, that will make a big difference, Adrian, won't uh, it? Certainly it will do. Uh, I mean, obviously, to get to this stage of the competition, he has to be good in the first place and for both boxers. So, I mean, it's, it's a great accomplishment to say that I've been in the, uh, the last 16 of the European Championship. Thomas of Spain, he's uh, executing that very high defense typical of the German uh, boxers. Obviously, he's been in, he would have been informed of the, the nature of having a guard and not allowing the effective punch to come through. Well, it's quite clear now that uh, Kiryukin is the predator, no doubt about that. And, uh, well, Jerome Thomas is very much on the defensive, isn't he? In fact, there looks to be quite a mighty bit lump of weight between these two lads. I mean, Kiryukin's a man in every respect, isn't he? He certainly is. And that can be a daunting factor sometimes for a young fighter coming through, knowing that the individual he's coming against is actually a, a seasoned, matured boxer. It, all, it could also be sometimes, in some situations, uh, a very intimidating factor also. Absolutely, yes. How old were you when you first uh, boxed in the Olympic Games in 88? Oh, 17 years old. 17. Yes. And nervous as possibly I can be. <laughs> that's young though, isn't it? I mean, that's, you're just out of the juniors. Yes, yes. But it just goes to show also that uh, with determination and a desire, it can take you a long way. So, round three then, here we go, and nil-nil still after two rounds. And if you're wondering what they do in the event of a draw here, since there are no draws in uh, this type of competition, there are draws, of course, in amateur boxing on the continent and places around the world, not in Britain, uh, more's the pity. 
Um, but what they do in the event of a draw here is they do what they call a count back. They discard the top and bottom scores of the five judges and make a, an average of the remaining three to get the proper score. And if it is level, what they do is they go and pull back in the higher and lower that were discarded previously, and that will determine the winner. Not an exact science, is it? <laughs>